we plan to bring you today's U.S. Central Command briefing from Doha, Qatar. The new F-A-22 fighter jet is currently on order by the U.S. military, which plans to use the jets as early as 2005. On Friday, a House subcommittee heard about the cost of the planes and progress in their production. From GAO Comptroller General David Walker, and officials from the Defense Department and Air Force. This is four hours. The quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats and International Relations hearing entitled Controlling Costs and Tactical Aircraft Programs is called to order. I'd like to first thank the Budget Committee for uh, allowing us to use their hearing. I apologize for being a, a speck late. And um, I'm going to catch my breath by asking Mr. Kucinich to uh, give his statement. Then I will, and then Mr. Tierney, I'll, uh, and then uh, I'll recognize Mr. Tierney and Mr. Schrock. I uh, thank the chairman very much, and I promise you that my statement will not take your breath away. So you can. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank Mr. Tierney for the excellent work that he has done on this issue, and I want to, we both, I know, appreciate the chair calling this hearing on the F-22. If there is a single message this subcommittee can send to the Secretary of Defense at the conclusion of our work here today, let it be this. End this program. Let it be a resounding and unified statement to pull the plug on this ill-fated program before we waste billions and billions of dollars which are hard-earned dollars paid by the American taxpayers. I hope the Secretary has a chance to review the testimony of the head of the U.S. General Accounting Office. Mr. Walker, thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure to have you before our committee. I've reviewed Mr. Walker's statement, and I can say I have uh, seldom seen a statement from the GAO that is so comprehensive, so thorough and so damning as to the testimony he's provided to this committee. It, it highlights the F-22 program as a prime example of how not to develop an aircraft. This program will end up being the poster child for a weapons uh, development program gone awry. I hope the Secretary also listens to our independent experts in the final panel. They come from outside government and have no stake in this other than ensuring our defenses are strong and our taxpayers' dollars are not wasted. And I think that equation is very important for the American people because there's some assumption that simply by spending a lot of money, you're going to get a lot of defense. Sometimes spending a lot of money just means spending a lot of money. The people who are here, who are the outside government uh, experts, are from the nonpartisan project on government oversight, the budget watchdog group, Taxpayers uh, for Common Sense, and the highly esteemed Center for Defense Information. I hope that the uh, Secretary will listen to their unanimity expressed and end this program. Listen to Colonel Everest uh, Rich Riccioni one of the developers behind the F-16, who says the costs of this aircraft are escalating to insane levels, so high, in fact, that we'll be able to afford only 100 to 175 planes. He says this result is manifestly absurd because it will render our fleet impotent. Listen to him and this program. Of course, everyone knows how badly the Air Force wants this aircraft, but production costs have increased nearly $20 billion since 1996. The number of planes the Pentagon can afford has plummeted to less than a third of their original goal. I realize there are many devoted people working very diligently, both at the Pentagon and for the contractors trying to streamline this process and find production efficiencies. The fundamental issue, however, is the underlying problem of cost and growth of cost that has never been addressed. Efforts to fund production improvement plans are an afterthought a remedial effort to offset damage that's already been done and will continue far into the future. Judging from their actions, certain Air Force <laughs> officials know they're in trouble. They've lashed out, accusing the GAO of inaccurately portraying the state of the program. Even worse, the Air Force and the Department have simply begun to disregard the federal statute that governs the overall cost of this program. 
The Air Force has argued, justified, and spun this as best they can. Their latest effort is called Buy to Budget. Or maybe considering uh, the cost of this should be goodbye to budget. I don't know what their slogan signifies, but if it means ignoring the congressional cast, uh, cost uh, cap, consistently under underestimating production cost growth, and then denying that they have a problem, they're definitely succeeding. Mr. Chairman, I support the elimination of weapon systems like the F-22 that are spiraling out of control with no end in sight. I support the budget submitted by the Congressional Black Caucus and a Progressive Caucus, which cancels the F-22 and replaces it with the increased procurement of the F-16. We can have a strong defense without having to spend and waste the kind of money that's being wasted. The Air Force will point out correctly that its fleet is aging rapidly and we need to replace hundreds of fighters. But buying fewer than 200 F-22s will do little to alleviate this problem. Instead, why not buy 500 F-16s and save the taxpayers $25 billion over the next 10 years? Mr. Chairman, again, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. I want to conclude my statement by urging the Secretary, in addition to listening to the chorus of voices coming from this committee today, to also to listen to his own better judgment. Uh, this was what was told to him when he came to the Pentagon. And uh, uh, I think that this type of program which we're going through today is the kind that should be ended, and hopefully the Secretary will agree with our assessment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, if Mr. Tierney, you're ready. I'd love it if you would give your uh, statement and just uh, say that uh, you have been um, a very uh, active <coughs> member on this committee in general and very uh, clearly interested in this issue. This is the fourth hearing we've had, and um, I will say it's, it's good to have institutional knowledge because we remember the three before. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, I want to thank you. Un under your leadership, this subcommittee has pursued our goal, and that's one of achieving the appropriate level of readiness to defend against and respond to the sophisticated threats that our nation may be facing. As you said, over the past four years, and particularly on this issue, I think we've lived up to the oversight responsibility, aggressively monitoring waste, fraud, and abuse as it relates to the Pentagon's procurement process. I appreciate that you're convening this meeting, and I think this fourth meeting is, is going to be telling. At past hearings, we questioned the Air Force and Defense Department personnel on the skyrocketing cost, unanticipated production and development delays, and recurrent infrastructure problems of the F-A-22. In response, we received assurances that these problems were being aggressively managed as various initiatives were being implemented. Unfortunately, today, in, in light of the new report released by GAO, we're here to ask the same questions and demand some real answers. My skepticism about this program, Mr. Chairman, and the viability of the F-A-22 has grown exponentially. This program, which began over 15 years ago, has yet to yield the expected results. As far as I'm aware, there's no dispute that the F-A-22 program has had $20 billion of unanticipated cost growth since 1996. In addition, the number of aircraft the Defense Department can purchase has plummeted from 648 to less than 224. The program has also encountered critical testing problems, including buffeting vertical fins, weak horizontal tails, overheating, and persistent instability in the development of avionics. Last month, test planes were grounded because the landing gear on one aircraft collapsed after the weapons bay doors under the weapons bay doors. Rather than addressing all these issues on their merits, the Air Force and the Defense Department have chosen a different path. It appears that they have been less than forthcoming with us and with you, Mr. Chairman, and with the investigative arm of cross uh, Congress, the General Accounting Office. Let me give you just a few examples. Issued in February, <coughs> excuse me, the GAO report we are discussing today recommended that the Pentagon reconsider its plan to forge ahead prematurely with the production of additional aircraft at least until testing problems were remedied. The Department of Defense appears to have rejected this recommendation. A March 28th Washington Post article revealed that the Department of Defense's Defense Acquisition Board approved the purchase of 20 additional aircraft. In this report, GAO recommended that the Pentagon fully fund initiatives for production efficiencies, which was, after all, a pro program of production efficiencies proposed and planned by the Department and approved by Congress. Apparently, the Department of Defense no longer intends to follow this course. In a January 2003 letter, they inexplicably blamed the General Accounting Office for not proving that these plans would actually save money, when, as I mentioned, in fact, it was the Pentagon's 
origination of that plan, and that's it emanated from the Defense Department. The General Accounting Office's report also recommended that the Pentagon provide Congress with information on additional cost growth that could occur if production efficiencies do not materialize. The Department of Defense wrote in that January letter to Mr. Alan Lee of GAO that they found no reason to comply with GAO's recommendation. GAO recommended that the Pentagon provide Congress with information on precisely how many aircraft it can procure within current cost limitations. In this case, the DOD also found no reason to comply. Mr. Chairman, more than just turning a blind eye to suggested recommendations of the General Accounting Office, those in charge of this program have not strictly adhered to actions taken by Congress, nor have they been responsive to requests of members. For instance, in the fiscal year 1998 Department of Defense authorization bill, Congress directed the Pentagon to adhere to a production cost cap. Rather than proceeding as directed, it appears the Pentagon has now begun using its own cost cap, which is more than $6 billion higher than the one Congress established. And Mr. Chairman, in a letter to the Pentagon in August of 2001, you requested information on projections and methodologies for future cost savings. To my knowledge, the Department of Defense did not fully comply with your request, and you were forced to write to the Appropriations and Armed Services Committees complaining that the Pentagon was obstructing the Committee's oversight work. In preparation for today's hearing, and in response to the GAO's February report, <coughs> I wrote to Secretary Rumsfeld on March 19th asking him for similar information the number of aircraft they expect to be able to purchase within the cost cap, and the various risk of future cost growth, and I asked for that information by, April, by April 7. I received a late response, which I think can fairly be characterized as unresponsive to the questions that were specifically raised. Let me just quote Mr. Chairman uh, to this letter, the response. Since the Department intends to seek legislation to increase the congressional cap on production, the Air Force does not estimate how many F-A-22 aircraft can be procured within that figure. Translated, it means since we have no intention of complying with Congress's cost cap, we're not going to answer your question and we're going to just try to make sure we have the votes to get that jacked up again and continue on with this folly. Let me reiterate that this program has had $20 billion in cost, cost growth since 1996 and the Department ultimately will procure less than one-third of the amount of aircraft they originally planned. When will the Department be held accountable for a failing program and how much longer are we going to allow costs to skyrocket uncontrollably? I sincerely hope, Mr. Chairman, that at today's hearing we get some honest answers, not empty assurances and equivocations, that we get them from all of our witnesses on these issues so that we can reevaluate this program and assess if there are wiser investments that we can make or not. We need straight talk from the Department today because this issue has far-reaching effects. As we strive toward a leaner, more agile defense system and in the midst of obligations in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, unabated deficits and many other urgent spending priorities, Ultimately, we have to make a decision in this program of whether it's worth it or not, whether it's worth the exorbitant funding, or whether we can put that to better military procurement or homeland security or other uses. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, Mr. Chairman, and again, I thank you for your good work on this issue and others. Thank the gentleman. At this time, we would recognize Mr. Schrock. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rubin. This is deja vu all over again for me. For about 38 years, most of which was spent in the United States Navy. I have heard discussions like this on every airframe that's come down the pike. All we're doing is changing the date from those that I used to hear when I was active duty Navy. We need to understand one thing. When you develop an airframe, it's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of time. There are going to be a lot of changes. There are going to be a lot of unhappy people. Just use the C-17 as an example. Everybody thought that was a horrible waste of money, and we realize now it's been a workhorse in this conflict in Iraq, and we need more of them now. And it seems like we tinker with these things so much, that's why we have th this number today, that number to tomorrow, and, and a week from now it'll be another number. I, I don't agree at all, as the first speaker said, that we should pull the plug on this thing. We're, in the, we're four minutes from the last of the fourth quarter. We're about to win this thing. I'm going to ask the Comptroller General at some point on page seven of, his, of the GAO report it talks about the production improvement program, and you look at what it was in 2000, and you look at the incredible uh, improvement it was in 2001, but I see nothing there for 2002. When I looked at my BlackBerry this morning, this is the fourth month of 2003, so I should certainly think that somewhere in, the, in this thing we should show what the improvements are for 2002, and I, and I don't see that at all. We're putting young men and women in airframes that are falling out of the sky. I'm not unconvinced that some of the crashes we've had in all the services in the last year or so are because they're riding, they're flying in old airframes that simply 
have just out, outworn, outlived their usefulness. And if we're truly going to change that, we've got to get some new airframes uh, in production. And the F-22 is clearly one of those. I have sat in the simulator of the F-22. I've gotten a good, strong briefing on that. And I, for one, based on my military experience, am convinced that this is the airframe of the future for the United States Air Force. It does things that uh, uh, no other airframe can do. And based on the threat we are going to be uh, facing here in the, in the decades ahead, it's certainly something that we have to take into consideration. There's no, it, the tax dollars are not being wasted on this. It costs a lot of money to develop these airframes, and we need to continue doing that. Talk about institutional knowledge. I realize there's some institu institutional knowledge up here, but I would uh, suggest that uh, 38 years of institutional knowledge on my part makes me somewhat knowledgeable on what these programs can do and, uh, and what we need to do to make them work. And sure, it's taken 15 years in development. Look at the history of a lot of the other aircraft. It's taken a long, long time to get these in the fleet in the in case of the Navy and with the Air Force and the Army and the others, those two services. But it takes a long time to make sure you get it right. And the purpose of testing, you know, sure you're going to have problems, but that's what testing is all about. If the attitude I've heard here this morning uh, had pre prevailed 100 years ago, we'd still be flying the Wright Flyer with Orville and Wilbur. And I think we need, to, we need to change that, and we need to change that pretty quick. So I, for one, am anxious to hear what the testimony says today and I, the, the people who are going to testify will say today, and I have some questions for them as well. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just think when lives are at stake and when the future of our country is at stake, we cannot sit still and sit idly by and allow our folks to be flying in airframes that uh, have simply outlived their usefulness. And I look forward to our uh, hearings today. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Um, Mr. Murphy, I understand you don't have a statement. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll just conclude, and, th and then, uh, Mr. Walker, uh, thank you for your patience. So we'll swear you in. And get Acquisition reform at the Department of Defense, DOD, remains a promise unfulfilled. Despite much heralded intentions to shed Cold War inefficiencies and bad habits, the Pentagon is still falling prey to rampant cost growth and interminable schedule slippage in the development of multi-million dollar weapon systems. The gulf between promise and practice has been apparent for some time. In tactical aircraft acquisitions, particularly the Air Force F-A-22 Raptor program, as in the past, we appear posed to spend far more than planned for far fewer aircraft. In three previous hearings before this subcommittee on F-22 development and production reforms, Successive projections of stabilized costs and realistic timetables have proven at best, at best optimistic. With projected production costs now 6.7 billion over the 36.8 billion statutory cap, the magnitude and persistence of rosy but wrong estimates suggest problems far more fundamental than mere overconfidence. For some time, the General Accounting Office, GAO, has been studying F-22 acquisition strategies and DOD adherence to commercial best practices. At the request of our subcommittee, colleague Congressman John Tierney, G GAO also examined current production cost projections and the extent to which those costs are being accurately conveyed to Congress. Today, we also released the GAO, GAO report done at the subcommittee's request that finds substantial waste stemming from a failure to develop standardized rather than system-specific aircraft tests and maintenance equipment. <clears throat> Unless aggressive cost controls and other acquisition reform strategies are embraced by, embraced by F-22 <clears throat> program management, the aptly named Raptor is at risk of devouring itself. As we will hear in testimony today, findings and recommendations by GAO and others on tactical aircraft acquisitions aim to stop the hemorrhaging of time and money in the F-22 program and prevent those problems and other major procurements critical to fighter fleet modernization. As our witnesses bring important information and expertise to our discussion, and we look forward to their testimony. All our witnesses bring important information and expertise to our discussion, and we look forward to their testimony. We are particularly grateful to Controller General David Walker for his leadership of GAO on this issue, and we appreciate the continued thorough and thoughtful work by Mr. Tierney on this oversight. I understand we also have another member who's on our side here, on the left side of me here. I apologize. 
Uh, Mr. Rumpersberger of Maryland, and I welcome uh, if you have any statement. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing on the uh, F-22 Raptor and controlling cost and tactical aircraft programs. I hope today we can have an honest discussion of this aircraft. I hope this is a balanced discussion between alleged cost overruns with performance and benefit to national security. The GAO report claims this project's cost overrun is due to several factors, including the delayed start of a multi-year production authorization contract inflation increases as a result of a revised production rate and because of the change in avionics suppliers of, for the F-22 Raptor. We have to remember that we live in a new age where threats can come from anywhere and anyone. Because of these unknown threats, we have to make sure that our military, our men and women who serve and fight for our freedoms have the most modern and technological advanced weapons. The F-22 Raptor is such a weapon. I represent many of our country's defense contractors. In my district, we have two Army bases, a Coast Guard yard. In my district, we build the radar that is used for the F-22 Raptor. I'm concerned about cost overruns in any endeavor, but we have to seek a balance. I understand that recent tests on performance of the Raptor has yielded remarkably successful results, both in terms of t technical and operational requirements. The success of this aircraft seems clear to me. In fact, the Raptor is meeting or exceeding all eight aircraft performance-related key performance parameters. I hope that the, those issues are also remembered as we continue this hearing. Now, I know some have said that the F-22 Raptor was designed for a Cold War threat. I would have to strongly disagree with that statement. The F-22 Raptor is much more. This aircraft has transformed itself. While maintaining all the air-to-air -air capabilities of the original design, the F-22 Raptor has also added technologies that will combine air dominance with precision attack capabilities and joint close air support for ground troops. Also, the F-22 will be vital to our national security interests in the 21st century. It is the only aircraft that will be capable of counter countering anti-access threats. Advanced SAMs, cruise missiles, fighter aircraft, theater, ballistic missiles, and weapons of mass destruction sites from day one. We have to remember that this was a project started almost 20 years ago. Technology in the past two decades has jumped leaps and bounds ahead of what we could have imagined. Issues will rise, but they will solve them, and our nation will be safer, and our armed forces will be stronger for it. Also, we have to remember that this fighter is the cornerstone of the Air Force's future capabilities. While we discuss the issues of the hearing, let's make sure that we do not inadvertently slow down this project, which in turn could hinder our armed forces capabilities. Now is the worst possible time to reduce production funds. The program is at a critical stage on the production ramp and learning curve. The tools, people, and training are in place for an orderly ramp up to max rate production. Furthermore, reducing procurement at this point will severely damage supplier confidence, which will reflect in an increased price, prices to the contractor. Currently, 65% of the cost of F-22 is in the supplier base. The resulting termination liability, increased supplier costs, and inflation impacts will further reduce the number of Raptors the Air Force will be able to procure. Delaying procurement will ex exacerbate the already critical logistics and operational impacts associated with retaining F-15s well past their planned retirement age. Finally, the single greatest enabler for reducing 22 costs is program stability. Program stability leads to supplier confidence which in turn yields increased supplier investments, increased program efficiencies, reduced production costs, and ultimately increased production quantity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ruppersberger. I appreciate your presence. I'm sorry I didn't notice you, that you were here earlier. I'm a little small. That's probably why. <laughs> <Yeah>, you <right. laughs> uh, This is really an ideal kind of hearing. We have members who have expressed a variety of concerns um, uh, on either end of this issue. And uh, we have... Uh, extraordinarily good documentation and we have wonderful witnesses okay. and uh, so we'll hope that um, we'll all find uh, the best answers to the problems that face us. We have before us to start the Honorable David M. Walker, Comptroller General of the United States, uh, the U.S. General Accounting Office and uh, we appreciate, sir, that you're here. As you know, we uh, swear in our witnesses and I'll ask you to stand. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
Note for the record, our witnesses respond in the, in the affirmative. I just will get one bit of housekeeping out of the way and ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place any opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose without objection so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record and without objection so ordered. Uh, and I think what we'll do is we'll have you give your testimony and then I'm going to give uh, 10 minutes to each, uh, each witness and, uh, excuse me, each uh, member. We did go to bed at 3.30 last night, um, maybe a little later for some. <laughs> at any rate, um, we'll begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Kucinich, uh, and other members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about DOD acquisition practices and the F-22 as an illustration of some of the challenges associated with historical uh, DOD acquisition practices. Let me also thank Mr. Schrock at the outset. On page 7 of the report that he refers to, he has uh, found the one typo in that report. Uh, those numbers for the graphs should be 2001 where it says 2000. It should be 2002 where it says 2001. Uh, and in fact, the text is correct. It just so happens that that's a typo. And thank you for pointing that out. Normally, they don't happen in GAO products, but it did happen in this case, and I apologize for that. Well, Mr. Chairman, and then I rest my case. There's major improvement being made, so I'll let that be said for the record. No, I, th I think the amazing thing is this is the first time I've ever encountered this in the entire uh, whatever. Well, uh, when, when it happens, we admit it, Mr. Chairman. But, uh, and, and there is improvement, but there's still a gap. So well, in any event, if yeah, I can Let proceed. me just say, without any hesitation, the work of uh, the JO and particularly under your leadership, has been extraordinary. And we all appreciate it, even when we don't like what your reports say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sometimes people don't like the facts, as we all know. Um, but before I begin to address the DOD acquisition process in general, and the F-22 in particular, I think it's very important to provide a solid foundation of the broader context and why this is important. As you know, Mr. Chairman and other members, GAO twice a year performs long-range budget simulations to project into the future as to what the future looks like. That latest simulation, which was done in January, shows that we face large and growing budget deficits due in large part to known demographic trends and rising health care costs. In addition, mandatory spending is far outpacing revenue growth. Without significant changes in mandated programs or significant tax increases, discretionary spending will come under growing pressure. DOD will ultimately feel this squeeze as well. When you take a look at discretionary spending, the largest accounts are in DOD. Weapons ac acquisitions alone account for $150 billion annually. Our weapons systems are far superior to any, of the, any other nation, but DOD will continue to need to spend significant sums to maintain this advantage and to replace aging equipment. In doing so, it must consider needs versus wants along with overall affordability and sustainability issues. We must also keep in mind that it's not just the superiority of our platforms that counts, it's the superiority of the people who man those platforms that count. With regard to the F-22, it's obvious that we're going to produce the F-22. We're in limited production at the present point in time. So it's not a question of whether or not it will be built, but how many, when, with what capabilities, at what cost, and very importantly, with what ripple implications to other Air Force systems and to DOD overall, including readiness. Given past experience and future challenges, in my opinion, Mr. Chairman, it's time for DOD to present a new business case as to how many F-22s are needed, why, at what cost, and with what ripple effect on other tactical air systems as well as other Air Force needs and DOD needs. The Air Force must move away from its historical plug approach to the quantity of F-22 Raptors. Whether and how many platforms to fund is a policy issue to be decided by the Congress. And irrespective of what Congress decides in that regard, 
It's important that any design, development, production effort follow a best practices approach unless there is a clear and compelling national security reason not to. A clear and compelling threat to our national security would be the only reason that one should not follow that approach in the opinion of the GAO. Our report shows that the Department has consistently made decisions with too little knowledge in connection with the number of historical systems. That is, the DOD has started programs with immature technology and had to manage technology development at the time they should have focused on product development. At production start, they did not have mature designs or manufacturing processes in control. Our first chart on the far left, which is also in the testimony, demonstrates that under DOD's historical approach, including with the F-22, systems take longer than anticipated to deliver and require performance compromises and cost growth increases that far outstripped initial estimates. The F-22 is a case in point. The F-22 started in 1986, yes, in the middle of the Cold War era. Costs have increased 128 percent and delivery time has increased 104 percent. In addition, planned acquisition quantities have dropped from the initial 750 to 276 and still dropping. Had the Air Force used the second chart, which is also in the testimony, the so-called evolutionary approach rather than the Big Bang approach, they would have avoided many problems, including significant cost, delay, uh, cost increases and delays, and they would have been able to field uh, certain, uh, earlier versions of, of, the, uh, of the tactical aircraft fighter uh, quicker to the troops to help modernize could you, could you uh, make that point again? Right. I was just asking a question. Yes. And, and Had the Air Force used an evolutionary approach rather than the Big Bang approach, they could have avoided many of the problems that they have experienced. Namely, they could have avoided the significant cost growth, the significant delays, and they could have fielded earlier versions of, a, uh, of the aircraft, of the platform, much quicker to try to deal with the aging uh, issue that has been mentioned before. Uh, namely, the idea being spiral development, which I'll come back to, which the Department is now embracing, where you try to develop versions and enhance those versions uh, over time, such that you're taking an evolutionary approach rather than a revolutionary approach, which is much more prudent, much more cost effective, much more consistent with best practices as we have reported. I have no doubt, and I'm sure that none of you have any doubt, that the aircraft that is ultimately delivered will have a high level of performance. It will be the best in the world. There won't be anything that's even close. In America, with enough time and enough money, anything is possible. However, inefficiencies in this program can only negatively impact other investment decisions the Department must make. There is a very real ripple effect on other TAC Air, Air Force systems, and DOD needs, especially given the increasing budget pressures that are here and are only going to grow in the future. GAO's best practices reports in this area make recommendations to correct these problems, start programs with requirements that can be met with available resources, especially mature technologies, achieve design stability by critical design review, and achieve statistical process control by production. While the Department has largely accepted many of GAO's recommendations with regard to best practices and, in fact, has incorporated these into their new updated policy, which is laudable and, and, and commendable, their application in practice to individual programs is not always consistent with policy. In other words, in design, it's there. In practice, it's not always there. It's uneven. They are getting better. It's obviously too late to adopt this for part of the F-22 program, but at least hopefully from here on out they can try to do that. The Department's recent emphasis on evolutionary acquisition, or as they refer to it, spiral development, is clearly a step in the right direction. That is, focusing on fielding some capability earlier and better managing the unknowns by improving weapon systems incrementally such that you go from a Series 1 to a Series 2 to a Series 3 is a very logical approach. And by the way, that's the approach that technology companies take 
as we see every day. And as we know, the fact of the matter is that's not the approach that the F-22 took. It was the Big Bang approach, and we're paying a big price uh, because of it. Another challenge to effective uh, acquisition of weapon systems in an efficient, economical, and, and meaningful way is the significant planned turnover or pre-programmed turnover in connection with key personnel responsible for the acquisitions effort. The far right, which is also in my written testimony, shows the typical number of key players that you would have within a life cycle of a major program. There's frankly just too much pre-planned turnover in order to appropriately affix responsibility and assure accountability for these programs. Uh, in the final analysis, Mr. Chairman, there's no question that however many Congress decides to fund, this will be a superior weapon system. I have flown the simulator myself. It is very impressive. But we must, however, consider the, the ripple effect uh, and to focus on wants versus needs. Uh, and in that regard, we're happy to continue to work with the Congress uh, in trying to provide information for your consideration in making the difficult choices that lie ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I thank him very much. Uh, I, we are joined by uh, Mr. Duncan, and Ms. Duncan, it's nice to have you here. Uh, I'm going to start out with Mr. Tierney, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Schrock, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Ruppersberger, unless Mr. Kucinich gets back. Um, and uh, we'll just keep going back and forth. I, I, uh, I think it's better to do the 10 minute round of questioning. Uh, and it will take us a little longer, but it is the best way to get information. So, Mr. Chairman, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Walker, and, and, and for the work that was done in this report by you and, and your ABLE staff. Um, I want to just lay a little foundation here, if I could, on, on the issue of production cost growth. In your report, you said the Department established a joint estimating team in 1996 to examine production cost growth. In 1997, the team found $13.1 billion in unanticipated cost growth. Is that fairly accurate? That's my understanding. Okay. It seems to me that that's a pretty astounding amount of unanticipated growth, but it didn't stop there. In 2001, the Defense Acquisition Board reexamined the issue and found another $5.4 billion in cost growth, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's correct. Another, I think, spectacular number, but it, it, it didn't stop there. In your report, most recently, you, you identified yet another $1.29 billion in cost growth. That's correct. Right. Now, did the Air Force include that amount in its estimate? It, well, it but, is, uh, but it also uh, it causes problems with regard to the current cap, as you noted before. Right. It went right by it, right? And the, uh, now, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, did they include that amount in their estimate? No, they did not. How do we explain that, that they didn't include it in theirs and the Air Force had it in, in, uh, in their estimate? You would have to ask the SecDef that. Okay. Can I, can I just ask if the gentleman deals ahead, it, what's the ahead. significance of not including it? Uh, an unreconciled difference off the top of my head. If the Air Force, is, which is responsible for the program, and, and is saying that this is what they think it's going to be, and then the, 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 uh, the Defense Department says, no, they're going to go with a different, different number, you have to wonder why, why that gap exists, which is the more accurate number, and what, if any, potential implication that can have on being able to stay within the cost cap. Uh, it's an unreconciled difference that needs to be explained. And I would think maybe the Air Force can do that. I know you've got uh, representatives of the DOD and the Air Force coming on after me. Thank you. Thank I think part of it, Mr. Chairman, is that you know, when you have the Air Force is responsible for this, uh, this system telling us that they're a billion dollars plus over and the uh, Office of the Secretary of Defense is ignoring that uh, and going on and then in response to our questions just basically telling us it doesn't matter what we had said as a cap as Congress or whatever, they're going to ask for more money anyway and they're just blowing on right by. I think it goes a little bit to the forthrightness of lack of that to this committee in terms of our estimates of how we're going to plan out a budget here in defense. But we can also carry a little bit of that over on into the, the issue of the number of planes that, that are going to be uh, that are going to be built. On your chart, you had six points of time, and during 1991, the planned development was 648 aircraft. That was Mr. Lee, am I right? Correct. In 1993, there was a bottom-up bottom review done and reduced that number to 442. That's correct. 
1995, it was reduced to 438 as part of the pre-production verification phase. And then during the 1997 Quadrennial Defense Review, it fell to 339. Correct. Then I think they took six aircraft over into production, so that really reduced it to 333. Um, now in 2001, Mr. Aldridge has written a letter to me, and if you extrapolate out uh, amongst all the other jargon, it, it looks like the number now is 224 aircraft while remain, if they try to stay within the congressional cost cap. Uh, That's with a cap. That's correct, Mr. Tierney. Right. So we're now down from an original 648 aircraft down to 224 aircraft. And all of that with the, the additional $1.29 billion in cost, production cost overgrowth. So we're, we have these charts going in opposite directions. The number of aircraft are being built and the cost of the program going up. Uh, were you able to determine just how much each one of these uh, systems is going to cost? So each, uh, pro, each plane is going to cost, in my estimate, it's about $200 million a plane. Am I right? It's over $200 million. Over $200 million. And if we reduced it uh, by another $2 billion, because of these overruns, it'd be another 10 or so less planes. You're really down about 214 if you keep them within the cost cap. It would be a reduction, correct. Right. So I think this getting those numbers down, that part of our inquiry from the department and from the Air Force is going to have to be, I think you stated quite well in your, what is the number that we need? What's the mission here? Is the mission anywhere still related to where it was 648 that we originally needed? And if it isn't, how has it changed? Um, why? Is it now allowable that we can perform the same mission if we can with so few planes? Uh, what are the costs ultimately going to be? And, and as you said, I think uh, quite clearly, then what's the effect on all the other things that we think we need as we move forward in our, our defense posture? Uh, but let me finish by just saying one of the major conclusions I got out of your report, Mr. Walker, was that uh, simply the Pentagon has not been providing Congress with the uh, information that we asked for, with adequate information really to assess and evaluate this program. They're not telling Congress how many aircraft they can buy while staying within the production cost limit. Uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what, describe for us, if you would, I think it would be interesting to put on the record, what the congressional cost cap is, and if you have an institutional memory, why we put that cost cap there. As I recall, and if you don't mind, Mr. Tierney, Mr. Chairman, I have Alan Lee, who's head of our effort in this area, so he may supplement my efforts if it's not a problem. Chairman, they want to swear him in, but and I'll go ahead and, and start. Great, thanks. Uh, due to the significant increase in the estimated cost of this program, Congress was concerned with me able to maintain some type of control over that and therefore ended up putting in a, uh, a cost cap with regard to production uh, as a means to try to control those costs. Uh, obviously, uh, that's one way that you can end up determining that you're not going to spend more money, but it doesn't necessarily assure how many aircraft you're going to get if there is a, a continued escalation of what the cost is in order to uh, produce that aircraft. But what is What has happened in the past, quite frankly, is that the Air Force has generally just plugged the numbers. Uh, whatever money, money you'll give them, uh, they'll produce whatever they can produce with that number of number, with, with that amount of money. My personal opinion is there have been huge subsequent events since 1986. And while you can clearly make a compelling business case for this platform in 1986, given the huge subsequent events since 1986, both as it relates to the budget, the, the national security posture, the state of the world, et cetera, there's a need to fundamentally reassess the business case and figure out what's the right number rather than what the plug is. Well, I, I think you put the, um, you know, the crux of this hearing, I think, right on the head. And, and the idea is that you know, we had set that cap, and it was up to them to determine how many they could make, but I'm not sure that we've ever heard back any of the justification or explanation for how the mission may or may not have changed and the goals and the other issues that, and questions that follow from that. Um, well, as you know, Mr. Tierney, originally it was for air superiority, and now it's an F.A. platform. So they are expanding. The Air Force is seeking to expand uh, the mission and the utilization right. of the 22. That doesn't make it cheaper. Uh, I, I still think there's the need for the business case. Uh, have, you, have you ever had a, an adjustment in the so-called business case? The gentleman suspend. I'll give him more time. Do we need to hear from Mr. Lee? If so, I, I need to not yet. Uh Well, we may, if, if it's okay. all right as a matter of uh, uh, if, if, caution. If, <laughs> then let's do that. Mr. Thank Lee, you. if you'd stand, please. Is, would you stand, please?
Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Just for the record, in the five years I've, nine years I've chaired hearings, we, the only person we didn't swear in was Mr. Bird because I chickened out. But I'm not going to have you get to that level. Okay, Ms. Cherney, you have the floor. Thanks. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned, obviously, for the fact that we set a cap and it appears to have been blown by without any prior discussion with, the, with Congress or, or conversation. But you also made a recommendation that they tell con that the Pentagon tell Congress how many aircraft they could buy within that cap. And as far as I can see, the, the recommendation was flat out rejected. Would there be some other interpretation you want to put on it? Uh, we, we haven't been provided that number, nor have you. All right. When I read the comments back, the information from the uh, department seemed to think that they were indicating it would be redundant and that they had already provided the information to Congress. Were you able to find any way that they provided that information to Congress? I'm not, I'm not aware of, of that. Now, I since I said that, sent that letter that I mentioned in my opening remarks or whatever and, and got a non-answer back on that. Uh, but in their letter, they indicated that the department, not Congress, the department had approved the procurement budget higher than the congressional cap. Does that mean anything to you in terms of the legality of the situation? Is there some law that I'm missing that allows the department to set a cap different from the cap that Congress has set? They can propose a cap in excess, but I don't see how in the world they're going to be able to spend the money. Uh, you would think, wouldn't you? Uh, when I compare that, you know, their statement to uh, Section 217 of the Public Law 10585, it certainly looks to me as if they're actively and affirmatively violating the letter and the intent of that federal statute. And I want to make that note to the chairman uh, because I think that it, it's a fairly serious matter. You know, we go about trying to have some accountability uh, in this Congress for large expenditures. Uh, we have a lot of uh, security issues to deal with. We set a cap, and the next thing we get back is a letter saying that the department, not Congress, but the department approved the procurement budget higher than the congressional cap. It seems to me to be a, a direct contravention of public law, and I think that we ought to take that under consideration and decide what we're going to do about that. Mr. Chairman, uh, can I, uh, yes, Mr. Lee. Can I uh, clarify that, please? Sure. I'd like to clarify something relative to, to the cap. Uh, it is true, uh, and, and uh, the Controller General, uh, in terms of his explanation of the um, intent of, of, the, uh, of the cap, is financial discipline to ensure that the expectations are met. It is, I should note to you that the uh, DOD, in their statement uh, to the subcommittee today, has identified the fact that uh, they are, they recognize that they are in, uh, will exceed the cap, but that they have not yet exceeded that cap, that they will exceed that cap in 09. That, and as a result, uh, they feel that what they need to do is to request from the Congress relief from that particular cap. So I, I, want, I wanted to make sure that I, I clarified that point. I appreciate you doing that. I just make the note that that's not at all what they said in their letter. The letter clearly indicated, and this is a quotation, that the department approved a procurement budget higher than the congressional cap. And, and that's correct. And as a matter of fact, Mr. Tierney, a, f a few years ago, Mr. Aldridge had identified the fact that he was uh, recommending termination of the cap. However, the current language, which I have just read uh, from the department, indicates that they would ask for relief. Uh, you would have to ask them whether or not relief means termination or in an increase in the threshold. Mr. Attorney, my experience has been is it's more the, the plug and hope approach. The plug is you plug the quantities and you hope that you can get more money in order to increase the quantities. But you can ask the Air Force. I shall. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schrock, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And General Walker, Mr. Lee, thank you for being here. You came on a good day. You got us all at a disadvantage because none of us got any sleep last night. So uh, we're, we're probably going to be victimized, but that's all right. We're, we're used to that. Um, Mr. Walker, let me make a couple, just a couple comments on what you said, things I agree with. Your comments on spiral development is absolutely right on, and a lot's, clearly a lot's happened since 1996, and I think that's the problem I have with any military platform, whether it's a plane, a ship, a tank, or whatever. My gosh, by the time you get into the fleet or into the air, is the threat still there? We need to tighten that at some point. And I agree with you that the defense budget pressures are horrendous for each dollar they spend, and we have to make sure we spend one each one of them economically, so I'm, I'm really right on with that. Let me start by asking, in your uh, 
report titled DOD should reconsider the decision to increase FNA FA22 production rates while development risks continue. You, um, you recommended limiting, limiting uh, the 22 productions to 16 aircraft. Now, I read, I read a lot of this stuff and I may not have seen it, but did you do a cost analysis, a cost benefit analysis on you, that report? And if you did, what did it say? Alan, could you cover that? Yes, sir. Uh, a risk analysis, uh, risk assessment was produced by DOD uh, about the same time that we issued that report. And there, what our recommendation was, sir, was that they update that particular risk assessment. And we still stand by that. And the reason why is their analysis was on the basis of the 303 aircraft. And now that it's reduced down to 276, we believe that following operational tests and evaluation and uh, all them showing that all problems have been fixed, I think it would be appropriate for them to revisit that risk assessment under those new conditions. 330, did you mean 333 or 303? It was down to the 303, the 303 because right? it was 295 plus oh, okay. PRT. I see. Yeah. I see. That's right. Did you uh, quantify the risk of retrofits? Because that can be mighty costly as well. Yes, and we, we recognize the fact that the cost would involve termination uh, costs to uh, to their subcontractors. However, sir, the concern that we had expressed and we've, that we have identified in several of our reports has been that it's more expensive to fix things after production. And it was a concern on our part that 73 aircraft would be on contract by the time operational and test and evaluation was completed. We thought that was a high risk. Our best practices work has clearly shown that, that the later you are in resolving these technology problems, you have an exponential growth in cost in, in increases in order to solve those problems. Uh, after the fact, and so that's the premise. Did you assess the impacts of limiting production? It depends on what you mean on the impacts. The impacts on the contractor, the impacts on our on our uh, on our defense posture. Which aspect? The the cost estimate. Yes. As I indicated, we we looked at their risk assessment, and we believe that they have, they are indeed several of the factors that they identified are correct. I think that you you would incur uh, termination uh, liability uh, 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 charges. However, the amount is one in which you would have to weigh that versus the cost of the retrofit. And, and I think there, that's the difference in opinion, sir. The DOD thinks that the changes and that they are making now to the issues that we had previously uh, indicated in terms of the fin, fin Buffett problem, overheating, and whatever, we think that it would be wiser to wait until operational test and evaluation is completed before you know what those, those changes would be. Part of the difficulty, as you know, is that when you know what the termination charge, that's something that you can calculate, you can quantify, it's, it's a certain amount. You don't know with certainty what the additional retrofit costs are going to be, but our experience it leads us to believe that they would be higher, uh, but you don't have the same degree of certainty, obviously, as you do in the contract termination charge. Yeah. Last year, Congress authorized and appropriated funding for greater than 16 in lots number three and lots number four. In fact, I believe the Defense Department recently approved lots three to be 20 aircraft and lots four uh, in increased procurement for up to 24 aircraft. I have those figures right. What would the termination liability be by reducing those down to 16? I, I don't know what, those, that, what that figure would be, sir. But I recognize the fact that there would be some if you were to. That would only impact upon the long lead items that uh, have, are under contract, not for the actual aircraft themselves, the long lead items for them. There's no way to determine that figure. No, I, I, I would suggest that that's something that it might be more appropriate for the DOD to do, and we'd be happy to take a look at it and comment on it independently if you would like. That'd be great. Thanks. What about the inflationary, inflationary impacts of delaying procurement? Of course, that is that's not the major driver of the cost. It's, uh, inflation not is not the major driver of the cost of this platform. Okay. 
Did you assess the increase in ONS costs of retaining our legacy aircraft longer? That's a real concern to me because and, and I, every, and year, I, every year there in life, uh, it's costing more and more money. It's just like throwing good money after bad. No, we did not. However, we are aware of it. And the fact of the matter is there is no guarantee that the F-A-22 would be able to be in place to uh, replace, for example, the F-15 at that point in time. Was consideration taken into account on uh, what the impact to the young men and women flying these planes would do, what, it would, what the impact would be on them by delaying uh, this, this capability. Alan. Because as, uh, as I said earlier, we're losing we're, planes and helicopters are falling I, out of the I, air at, at an alarming rate as far as I'm concerned. And it happened a couple times in Iraq, and I'm wondering if it was from hostile uh, a hostile situation, a combat situation, or if the frames have just worn out and they had, they had mechanical repairs that have just been stretched to their limits? There's absolutely no question that the Air Force faces a serious problem with regard to the aging of its airframes. At the same point in time, I would respectfully suggest that part of the business case analysis that I had recommended earlier needs to take that into consideration. It may or may not be that the F-22 is the answer to that, Clearly, you're going to have the F-22, but how many do you need? And, and to the extent that you end up deciding that that's going to be a different number, it may end up freeing up more dollars to be able to bring more plat platforms to our airmen uh, and women quicker than otherwise would be the case with the F-22. So there are trade-offs here, I think. If I can add to, to what the Controller General said, two years ago, the Ge General Accounting Office actually did an analysis on what the age of the fleet was. And we raised concerns to Secretary Rumsfeld in anticipation of the analysis that they would be doing for the quadrennial defense review. And we identified the fact that even with the investments that they would be making in the FA-22 and the JSF and the FA-18EF, that the average age of the fleet, of the tactical fleet, was still going to be going up. And as I'm sure you, you can uh, recognize the fact that it's because the quantities, the airplanes are costing more, and so therefore the fleet is still aging. But by bringing something like the F-22 into the fleet, boy, it's going to drop, and they can, they can decommission some of the old aircraft. It would certainly bring the average age of that life down dramatically, I, I would perceive, anyhow. The problem is, is the numbers. Yes. Uh, yes, you're right. That you, if you can bring in the F-22, that helps because it's obviously brand new. On the other hand, these cost so much per copy uh, that it really, as our report shows, it really is not going to help the average that much. It might help with regard to the 15, but it's not going to help with regard to the overall issue because the quantities just aren't big enough and they're getting smaller year by year. Yeah. Uh, I'm led to believe that the current Air Force estimate in the, uh, in the fiscal 04 president's budget is for 276 aircraft. Does the Air Force, does that current estimate account for your concerns? Uh, my view is, as I mentioned before, is, is I don't think that we should be plugging the numbers. I, I don't think, I think a new business case is needed. A new business case is needed to say the right number, why, at what cost, and what is the ripple effect. Uh, that was not done in coming up with that number, it's my understanding. Could it be? Could, could it be? Oh, clearly it can be done. I think it should be done. Time has expired. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Gil, for just one question through you to the uh, witness, if we could. Sure. Uh, one of the uh, comments was made was that they, that inflation wasn't the major driver of the cost of this aircraft. I'm wondering if you'd ask the gentleman if he can identify what, in fact, is the major uh, driver of costs for this aircraft, the one or other factors. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question, Mr. Chairman. Well, the uh, Inspector General, the. Uh, oh, I see. The, uh, Mr. Walker indicated he said what the major driver of cost of this aircraft was not inflation. What it, it, are the major drivers of cost in this? I'm sorry, I, uh, now I understand. Initially in the 13.1, um, inflation was a significant portion of, of that. Uh, airframe was the second most important. Then in the $5.4 billion increase, the time when that occurred, it, there was a flip-flop that actually airframe and labor costs were the ones that were most important with 
inflation being second. So the, the controller general is, is correct in that the second it's it's becoming less of a of an issue. But the fact of the matter remains that a lot of that cost is because of the airframe and labor costs associated with it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ruppersberger, for ten minutes. Thank you. Ruppersberger, excuse me. It, it, that's why they call me Dutch. Either way, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> We now okay. recognize Dutch for 10 minutes. That's fine. That's great. And by the way, uh, as, as far as the sleep is concerned, it's been said sometimes that sleep's just a waste of time, so we should be okay today. <clears throat> okay, getting back to the subject matter. Um, first thing, uh, Mr. Tierney, I think that, it, that you've, uh, I praise you for bringing this issue to the table. Uh, accountability is, is always important, and especially when it deals with cost, and especially what's happening with our economy. Now, the Defense Department is doing a tremendous job, in my opinion, with respect to the war. We're winning this war because of our, our technology, because, because of our, 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 our uh, military and our training of our men and women. Um, and we want to be superior in this, this realm so we can have our freedoms. But after hearing the testimony and what's happening here today, it seems to me that, 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 more, that if we were more honest, that the Defense Department was more honest about cost and time estimates, these programs could be a lot more cost effective so that we all know what the ground rules are. If in fact there is a problem and we have to move forward because of development issues or whatever, then we lay that on the table and we come back. But we do have oversight. That's what makes this country so great. We cannot keep spending forever and we have to know, understand where the programs are, how, how effective they are and what the costs are and whether we can afford them. Now, let me ask you this question. We talked about um, <clears throat> the GAO study is con uh, that, that uh, inflation uh, you did is, is a factor in the cost overruns. Um, maybe we should give uh, Chairman Greenspan credit for that since inflation hasn't grown as high in the last 10 years. But how about the issue of cost of technological, uh, technology uh, and the advancements in technology? Has that, incre has that increased the overruns as we're going through the process, the development process? And then technology is, is changing forever. Has that in any way increased the cost? Obviously, the cost of trying to deal with some of the technology problems, avionics, et cetera, has, has been a significant contributor to some of the additional costs in this program. But as you know, generally over time, as we've seen in the private sector, uh, that, that once that technology has been, uh, has matured, uh, that over time, advances in technology tend to drive costs down, not up. It's, it's the development parts, the research part, right. But it can go both ways. I mean, it, it depends on where... It depends on where you are on the cycle. Right, sure. Now, the knowledge-based product development process has to show that it can be manufactured within cost, schedule, and quality targets. Uh, did the manufacturers of the Raptor demonstrate that? I don't, I don't believe that has been done sufficiently. Uh, one of the concerns that we had expressed uh, as part of our reviews has been, for example, uh, the stability of the uh, statistical process was, was not demonstrated. Uh, earlier in the program, there we had concerns about the stability in terms and the proxy being how many of the drawings, engineering drawings themselves were completed at a certain time. Those would be indicative of a program that was ready to be produced at large quantities. All right, now, in your testimony, you state that because DOD did, did not follow the steps that, quote, a cascade of negative effects became magnified. You continue by adding, these led to acquisition outcomes that included significant cost increases and scheduled delays, poor quality, <coughs> and reliability. Now, is it your contention that the F-22 is a bad, unreliable product? No. no that's, not that's not what we're saying. What we're well, saying is... That's why is I asked the question. I wanna... No, that's correct. Okay. And now, do you think if DOD applied knowledge-based product development process, it would stop or kill the Raptor program? Well, you can't change history. Uh, you, you can try to learn from what has happened in the past to do two things. One, not make the same mistakes going forward with regard to the F-22, with regard to additional production and funding decisions. And number two, to make sure that we don't make these mistakes on other weapon system platforms, such as the JSF, et cetera, going forward. A concern of mine, and, and, and I think this is a part of the issue on you have DOD and then you have the vendors. Will it make contractors and vendors <coughs> hesitate in developing the best product to reach these goals? That happens where we set a certain, certain limitation and then in order to get those goals we don't have the quality product. What, do you feel that, uh, that that will have any impact? Could you, specula I could you speculate believe, on that? 
we, we strongly believe, GAO, that by following commercial best practices as we've outlined, that that is in the interest of the government, that is in the interest of the contractors, that is in the interest of the warfighter, and that is in the interest of the taxpayers. There's absolutely no question about that. Because when you have a situation such as the F-22, where you have delays, cost increases, compromised performance standards, nobody's a winner on that. All those parties are losers. And so, uh, again, I don't want to unduly pick on the F-22, because that's, we were asked to use that as, as illustrative example, uh, if you will. But there's no question that following commercial best practices is a win-win situation for everybody involved. All right. Well, in your testimony, you also stated <clears throat> that DOT, DOD is too rigid, and because of that, program managers are basically setting themselves up to fail. Now, do you think the most honest cost and time estimates, and you've really answered this, uh, will make programs more cost effective? And I, I, partially what we need is a cultural transformation, quite frankly. I, I would describe historically uh, that uh, part of the pressures at DOD and part of the culture has been get the money, spend the money, hit the milestones. That's basically was what's happened. And if you don't end up getting the money, spending the money, hitting the milestones, then there can be negative ramifications to one's career. Uh, there, hasn't been, there hasn't been a whole lot of positive reinforcement for individuals to uh, make tough choices and enhance transparency when things are not going as you would like it to. Uh, and so I think, you know, there is a cultural issue here, and I think part of the problem is what I put up before, is you, if you're going to change program managers so frequently, uh, you know, that's a fundamental problem in, in assuring a reasonable degree of continuity and an appropriate degree of accountability for positive outcomes over time. Uh, and what's, what they're really talking about is, is the, the management issue of accountability and, and uh, that accountability. And yet, I, I'll say this, my own impressions, trying to tra change the culture of DOD at the time of war uh, when we're hopefully all behind, you know, what we, what our, at least our military and what's going on to protect our freedoms, that's going to be very difficult. And that's why I praise Ms. Mr. Tierney for bringing up this issue on a very, very, um, a, a piece of, a, or, or F-22 that is, is something that's very important to our, our freedoms, uh, but yet it's, it's something that seems to be totally lack of accountability. And I would hope that we would somehow, this program would help us in that regard, and also not send a chilling effect to, to the vendors and the manufacturers that are put in a very, very difficult position because they have to move into an arena where they're told this is what we have to do and then DOD uh, says well, do what you have to do and then you have Congress here trying to hold a, make, make them accountability. Thank uh, you. If, Thank if you. I can, yes. Mr. Chairman, I think you're right that you need some stability, you need some certainty, but I would respectfully suggest that the way you get that is by basing the decisions on what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, how many you're going to have based upon an up-to-date business case and then after you've done that, to employ these commercial best practices with regard to the execution on that. Both of those things, I think, will help to provide increased certainty and stability, which, we, which you talked about that the contracting co community needs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you talk about DOD, I've got a son who's a company commander in Iraq right now with the Marines. Uh, there's no question that we are number one in the world in fighting and winning armed conflicts. There's nobody even close. And it's not just because of our platforms, it's because of our people and our technology. Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is DOD is a, they're an A in that, number one in the world in effectiveness. They're a D in economy, efficiency, and accountability. And with the budget pressures that we face, it's not in our collective interest or, frankly, in their interest not to deal with these issues. And if it weren't for hearings like this, it might even get worse. But let me say one other, one other issue I think needs to be, be addressed, too, and that's the issue of flexibility. Because we still do have to, I mean, you, we talked about inflation, which you're saying right now doesn't, is, hasn't impacted uh, the, the advance in technology. We still need flexibility, but maybe that can be looked at on, on an annual or biannual basis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now, the Chair recognizes himself for 10 minutes. Uh, I just want to follow up on uh, some questions you were just asked. You referred to um, there's not real positive reinforcement. There's cultural issues which interfere in... Um, could you elaborate on what you mean by what sort of positive reinforcement and cultural issues are not there that you need to have there? Well, the fact of the matter is, is to the extent that you experience problems, 
human nature being what it is, you want to try to solve those problems. At the same point in time, uh, if, if additional transparency associated with those problems could lead to reduced funding uh, or could, uh, uh, then there obviously is a conflict there. My view is, is that for any system to work, you know, whether it's a, whether it's an acquisition system, you know, whether it's a health care system or a corporate governance system, whatever, you've got to have three things. Incentives for people to do the right thing, including knowing when to say no. Two, reasonable transparency to provide some assurance that people will do the right thing because somebody's looking, and that's what oversight is all about, in part, in periodic reporting. And thirdly, appropriate accountability mechanisms if they don't do the right thing. And do we have the first one in that category? Uh, we don't have the right incentives, I don't believe. No, I don't, I don't believe that the incentives there right now are, are there for people to make tough choices to say no uh, in, in appropriate circumstances, whether that be with regard to platforms, whether it be with regard to quantities, whether that be with regard to delay moving into the next stage because we don't have, you know, the, the technology matured to the right level. And that's a pyrrhic victory, you know. I mean, if you, you get the money, you spend the money, you, 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 and you don't really hit the milestone. In form, you hit the milestone, but in substance, you don't. Everybody's a loser on that, and I think people need to understand we need to move away from that. But, but Alan, you're, you, no, you're closer I, to I, it day to day. I absolutely agree with, with the Comptroller General. It's, the issue is um, there's obviously a disincentive to uh, be able to tell your superiors that you have problems with your program because that might uh, translate into reduced funding in the following year. Um, when the, the evolutionary approach that, that we have identified in terms of uh, making sure that we have the sort of technologies that would match those expectations and the resources, I think that would be the answer, sir. So, so if in practical terms, how do we do that? What's standing in the way of that implementation? Well, for one thing, I think is in so much of government, we need to end up uh, defining how do you measure success, and you need to end up aligning institutional individual performance measurement reward systems uh, with a modern definition of success. I will tell you, there, there are dedicated professionals, both in uniform and civilians, working on this program and other programs. They're not the problem. The problem is the system. I mean, the way that we, the, the system and the process and the historical ways of measuring success. I mean, people are doing their best to try to make this system and others work. I have no doubt about that. That's frustrating. Uh, let me move to another area. Uh, since the FA-22 is still in development, why is it too late to adopt a knowledge-based acquisition approach, and what's its impact upon the joint state? Well, it's right. not too late prospectively for what's left. It's obviously too late for the stages that we've been through, and I think part of that has to do with the issue that was raised before. You know, what type of quantities should we be producing uh, at this point in time? What is the maturity of the technology, and do we want to increase production rates, uh, we, should, we should use the commercial best practices maturity of technology concept as part of that decision making process, not as to whether you're, not, you're going to produce, but when and how many you're going to produce. Mr. Chairman, the FA-22 is both in development and in low rate production. It's been in low rate production since 2001. Development is about 95 percent complete. That is the reason why it is very difficult to apply those principles. Now, are we, I guess when I look at the numbers of what was estimated that would be first be developed where we are now over time, uh, how many do we really need then? Uh, do we need 300, 400, 500, 200? I mean, this is very frustrating to see these numbers it, floating all over. It's not our job. We're not in a position to be able to tell you how many we need. I, I think that's where the Department of Defense has to make a business case, and I think they need to make that ba business case based upon today and tomorrow, not the past. What, what are the, what's the situation in the world today? What do we expect it to be in the future to the best of our ability? What are the types of threats that we face? What type of capabilities do we need? To what extent does this address that threat? And at what cost and at what ripple effect on the JSF, on the space systems, on, frankly, uh, programs for other services as well? And one other category I want to ask about is the, the time frame on uh, production and development here. When I look at some of the numbers, um, the look at inflation and uh, change orders or whatever else is in there, uh, I'm, I'm puzzled on this when we look at the, the cost overruns. Are those pretty clearly in the initial estimates of cost of production when it was set up years ago? 
there would be anticipation of this inflation, there would be anticipation of change orders, anticipation of technological changes? Not, not the change orders. Yeah, the change orders you wouldn't. I mean, the inflation and all you would. Obviously, you know there's going to be some change orders. You know, frankly, change orders you know, affect many different types of things, including, for example, the Capital Visitor Center. There are change orders on the Capital Visitor Center, and therefore that ends up costing more money. And so it's a basic concept, but let's don't go into that subject right now. I agree with you, Mr. Ryan. Now, I just uh, think of whether, and, and people who may be watching this but have know nothing about these planes, recognize whether it, adding a room onto their home or building a new school building in the local school district, um, that very often one gets these estimates and it sounds like good and affordable and inevitably there's changes that come through. Uh, and so I'm wondering if that's part of what we ought to put into our initial estimates of where things are to recognize that's inevitable part of any production. Uh, and in, instead of getting uh, hopes up among the Department of Defense and Congress so we can build this many planes for this amount of money in this amount of time, that shouldn't we, I mean, I would think any business would be anticipating that that's part of the cost of, of building production, that there will be those changes. Well, I would respectfully suggest there, there's a strategic level for this discussion and then kind of a, a tactical level. On the strategic level, when you're talking about the platform itself, whatever platform it is, whether it's F-22 or whatever it might be, you know, you have to say not what you want, but what you need. Uh, I, I think to a certain extent, uh, one could debate whether or not this platform, it may have been a need in 1986, it may or may not be a need now, it may be more of a want. I don't know, that's the business case. You've got to be able to develop a business case. Uh, and so, as I said before, you know, in America we can do anything with time and money. We can build all kinds of things, but we have limited resources, so we have to figure out what should we be doing based upon credible threats, what can we afford to do, and what are the, you know, what are the ripple implica uh, in in implications of that. Thank you. I yield back the balance. Uh, exactly. Ask the gentleman to yield so that I don't have to ask for additional time. I'll just try to squeeze this in. Sure. On that, thank you. Uh, one thing I wanted to make clear, however, is in the original estimates of this program and others, uh, people make predictions of some element uh, of change. I mean, they understand there are going to be some change orders, there are going to be some inflationary factors, whatever. We're talking here uh, originally of some $13 billion plus of unaccountable. Uh, unforeseen expenses that there should probably some portion of those, not a great, great portion of those, should have been foreseen. Mr. Walker, has the Department of Defense or the Air Force ever indicated to the GAO any change in their plans for the number needed from the original plan? Have they ever said to you, well, we've made a determination uh, that we're going to need a different number from that 600 and whatever it was in the beginning, uh, and here's the reason why? Have they ever come forward with that? I haven't seen that, and candidly, I haven't seen the business case that I talked about before. All right. Um, and so I, so I guess we can follow right down the line. So they haven't uh, indicated why they need those numbers. They haven't indicated what the cost per plane would be at that number. And then I guess we can assume that then there's never been any analysis done of what the effect of that final number would be on other plans for the Air Force or other plans for the Department of Defense uh, systems and, and things of that nature. And, and this would be a good area for us to start looking at here from what I gather. We haven't seen it, but I will say this. The department really is making progress in many regards. There's no doubt about that. They're making progress not only with regard to the adoption of spiral development, they're also making progress with regard to trying to uh, match the palm uh, with the budget, the program planning with the budget. They're doing that. That's a positive step. But they're only looking out one and two years. The problem is you need to consider longer range implications total life cycle cost. And so you can manage that for the next year or two, but the implications over the longer term are much greater on the ripple effect than in the short term. And has the Department of Defense or the Air Force ever um, indicated to the General Accounting Office, if you made less of these uh, FA-22s, uh, with the money not spent on those, what other platforms or systems uh, could be increased, and how would that affect the mission of the Air Force and the Department of Defense generally? They haven't, but I think there's something they need to do because the, it, there's a very real issue of aging platforms. There's no doubt about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I recognize Mr. Duncan. Ten minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, <coughs> I was interested, uh, Mr. Walker, in your uh, statement. You say pro the problem is uh, the system, uh, not the people, that you would give uh, the Pentagon an A on the people in technology or something, and a D in efficiency, economy, and accountability or something to that effect. I, I think actually they're 
many fiscal conservatives who would uh, make that D and F uh, when it comes to programs like this. We, I was told by staff that in 1991, they, they don't have the original cost estimate. The old shell game in Washington is to uh, lowball the cost of any program when it first starts and then allow all these cost overruns and add-ons and everything else. They, they, they say they don't have what the original estimate was in 86, but in 91 they estimated that these planes were to cost $93 million apiece. And now, you said a few minutes ago, it's now over $200 million. They tell me it's $257 million. Is that, is that roughly correct? Alan, please. It, Mr. Duncan, it's nice to see you again. I, yes. A few years ago, we used to, uh, I testified before you on transportation right. issues. Right, I remember. It's different now to talk yes, about sir. defense. <laughs> but switching gears to, to defense, there are different numbers because... Uh, the Air Force, in, in, in their explanation, for example, in today's statement, identifies uh, how it's decreased by lot. The figure that the Controller General gave to you is an average figure for the entire uh, uh, program. Well, that, that, that leads me into something else. You know, unfortunately, here in Washington, it seems that too many people forget that $1 billion is a lot of money. $1 billion is a lot of money. And yet, I have... Uh, uh, from the staff, it says the current production cost cap is $36.8 billion. Apparently, this is what was set by the Defense Authorization Act in 98. The current production cost estimate is $42.2 billion, according to the Air Force, and $43.5 billion, according to the GAO. Therefore, the project is $6.7 billion above the cap. I mean, that, that should be mind-boggling or shocking to most people. Uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to shock anybody around here, but it, sh it, it sure should. Uh, wh what, wh what is the difference? Uh, where is the $1.3 billion that the Air Force and the GAO disagree on? Do you, do you know even, that's, even that should be considered a lot of money? It wasn't a disagreement between the Air Force and GAO. As we identify in the report, the Air Force acquisition plan identified that figure of $1.3 billion. What we were indicating in the report was that the Office of the Secretary of Defense's number of 43 initial uh, did not include that 1.3, and that's what we were pointing out, that, that were they to consider the full, uh, all of the costs that came subsequent to their decision in August of 2001, they would include that. Now, in, in direct answer to your question, the 1.3, part of that, for example, uh, uh, and we heard about this earlier, is the change in subcontractor. For example, initially, a, a subcontractor, the avionics, one of the avionics subcontractors, actually was part of Lockheed Martin. Uh, subsequent to that, that particular subcontractor was sold. So the savings that they originally thought that they would get from somebody being within and not incurring uh, uh, having to pay for profit, now they're having to incur that, that uh, extra cost. Well, you know, I, I love my children, but uh, I'm always on to them about not wasting money. And in the same way, I've always considered myself to be a pro-military type person. But that doesn't mean that I just want to sit back and watch the Pentagon waste billions and billions of dollars. Uh, it, it seems to me that if we can justify this, we can justify almost anything. I mean, just anything. And I know these... Uh, Companies are making obscene profits out of this, but this is wrong. Uh, this this is just this is just wrong to have these kinds of uh, overruns. I know this is a a time of great patriotism, uh, and and we're all uh, proud of the job the troops have done. And there's certainly nothing against uh, against them. But uh, uh, we this doesn't mean because everybody's uh, pleased about. Uh, the quick and decisive victory in Iraq that we could just that we could should just sit around and justify billions and billions in cost overruns, and that we can just sit back and uh, cavalierly uh, uh, accept anything that happens in the Defense Department, uh, because when we have when we just lose billions and billions of dollars, it hurts poor and lower income and working families all over this country, and we seem to forget that. And then if we talk about these change orders. Uh, you know, I guess some people would like to have a Rolls-Royce, but maybe they have to settle for a Mercedes. 
Uh, and, and I think that's uh, the way it is with some of these uh, uh, planes. Uh, we, we can buy a plane with every bell and whistle in the world on it, but we might be able to buy one for a uh, uh, a uh, hundred million dollars less that could do ju that would be just as safe and do just as good a job. Uh, I'm a low tech person living in a high tech world, but th they tell me that a computer is obsolete on the day that it's placed on a desk, and, and that's how fast technology is moving. So if we're going to have research and development, and then we start production, and then two or three years down the road. We come in with all these change orders because we've got some new high-tech uh, gadget that somebody wants on there. I mean, where is it going to stop? These, these costs, it, it, what we're going to see in the future, we're going to see worse. We're going to see worse cost overruns and, and explosions in programs than what we're seeing here today. If we, don't, if we don't stop this, we're in bad trouble in the years ahead. Yes, sir, Mr. Walker. In fairness, Mr. Duncan, I think that the DOD has adopted most of our recommendations with regard to their acquisition policy. Uh, they are moving to an evolutionary spiral development approach. With regard to some of the newer systems, not the F-22, but with regard to some of the newer systems, we've, we've uh, definitely seen improvement. Uh, the biggest problem of late has been that sometimes they'll have uh, adopt a policy that embraces commercial best practices, you know, evolutionary development rather than the Big Bang approach, et cetera. But in practice, they don't always implement that policy. It's getting better. Uh, this amount of money, we can't afford it as a nation. Frankly, DOD can't afford it because with the budget pressures that, that are coming, uh, it's going to have a very real effect. They're going to have to be trade-offs. So they can't afford these kinds of overruns either, uh, I would, I would uh, suggest. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm for a strong national defense, but we're spending more on defense than just about all other nations in the world combined. And there, it seems to me that if we're going to do all the other things that people want us to do, we have to limit some way. I'm glad to hear that you're saying that things are improving or getting better. Uh, Mr. Duncan, I, yes, I'd like to yes, build on yes, what, what, that, yes, what the sir, Controller right General ahead. said. In, in terms of the, the, the way that the program has recently uh, uh, been managed, DOD has itself, and I would uh, would assume that Dr. Samber, when he, when he comes on in a few minutes, he will tell you that he was not satisfied when he came on board and he found out that the development costs had increased by $876 million. They have made, and they have told me, they have made significant manage, management changes both at the Air Force level and also insisted that that occur at the contractor level. So that, the concern is there, and I think well, I that's, uh, that's encouraging. I'll tell you this. If people aren't concerned or upset or shocked about what's happened in this program, they've been in Washington too long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Uh, Chair, recognize uh, Ms. Maloney for 10 minutes. I, I thank the Chairman for, for calling this important hearing, and I, I'd like to be identified with the comments of my uh, colleague on the other side of the aisle, Mr. Duncan. Uh, but first, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Mr. Walker and all, all the panelists. I just came from the floor where I put into the record the entire GAO report that you did on the Royalty and Kind program and uh, how that's going to end up costing taxpayer dollars. So I congratulate you on, on the work that you've done to help us uh, manage government better. And if there was ever a, a program that needs to be managed better, this program was called the flagship of acquisition reform uh, when it started. And uh, now it looks like a, a disaster personified. Uh, you've uh, done a good job in sort of pointing out what went wrong. I, I'd like to join with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle asking Mr. Walker to come forward with some suggestions on how we prevent this in the future. We obviously need stricter guidelines, more accountability, and uh, more honesty in contracting. And one of the things that we did in New York City when I uh, worked there, when companies had huge overruns, in the, we, we kept a record of it so that when they came back for city contracts, they got demerits for poor performance and their ability to get a future contract was diminished so that uh, contractors then tried to be more honest about how much it's going to cost. Uh, but have, going into a program where we're going to get 648 
planes and I see uh, uh, one of my colleagues who was a officer in the military, Mr. Schrock, uh, uh, in the Navy before this, I, I know he must be outraged that we could, we went in there, we're going to get 648 planes, now we can only get 224 because of the tremendous uh, $20 billion cost overrun. And, and my question is, how can we put more accountability into the cost overrun situation so that it doesn't get so out of hand? You know, granted, if the military comes in and says, I want to redesign the plane, that's another thing. But uh, when, they, when they happen, it's usually the contractor saying, I need more money. So how do we, how do we put more uh, government control or accountability or better planning on this? And uh, as uh, Mr. Duncan said, we spend more than the whole world combined on our defense. We are ready for the next war. Uh, we are ready for any war, uh, but uh, we've got to get some control on this military spending or our deficits are going to go up and we're not going to have the money for education or for uh, child care or for health care here at home. So, Mr. Walker, how do you... We, we have made a number of recommendations. Let me deal with it on several tiers, just briefly. But, but on the cost overruns, how, sure, would you, understand. how would you control the cost overruns? The, the, I think the primary way that you do it is, is twofold. Number one, you adopt the evolutionary best practices approach that we talked about, uh, where you uh, make sure that you're trying to, to use spiral development, which is what the department is talking about, to mature the technologies, to develop certain levels of capabilities such that you can get some platforms delivered earlier, then you end up upgrading over time as new technologies mature and as they become available uh, to do that. Uh, I think that, that makes eminent good sense. That was not done in the case of the F-22. They're, uh, they're trying to adopt that practice with regard to other systems. I think in addition to that, you have to look at your contracting terms. You have to make, make sure that your contracting terms provide for the appropriate incentive and accountability mechanisms uh, to the contractors uh, to, to make sure that, it, you know, if, if things go better than you thought, then somehow they will suffer, they, they will get gain from that if they go, it goes better than you thought. If it doesn't go as well as you thought, then they may, they may have some penalty associated with that. Frankly, many of our contracts don't work that way. Uh, we need to make sure that we've got an adequate amount of transparency in the interim to know how things are going. So not only DOD can manage it better, but the Congress can oversee it better uh, in order to try to help intervene earlier rather than after, uh, after it's too late to really do much about it. So those would be a few things off the top of my head. But how would you build the incentive in? I mean, it, it sounds good. Put incentives in that they perform better. Specifically, how would you do that? We're going to pay you more if you, if you keep your contract uh, in line, or we're going to keep a record of your overruns and penalize you the next contract. How do you build in the carrot and the, and the uh, accountability? Well, frankly, this happens in a lot of different types of contracting arrangement, not just weapon systems. It can happen with regard to information technology systems. It can happen in a whole range of areas where you end up defining what you want. You define, uh, you know, key success fi factors. You develop appropriate milestones as to cost, quality, uh, timing, uh, and, and performance being another element. Uh, and, and to the extent that people end up uh, exceeding those expectations, they may have some gain from it. To the extent that they don't, they may suffer some penalty as a result of it. The problem is, is that many of the contracts, frankly, that we have at DOD uh, are so complicated that it's almost impossible to understand, much less to administer. Uh, and we, we, could, we could have days of hearings, I think, on this, but I'd be happy to visit with you individually on this if you want. Okay. Thank you. I recognize Mr. Shea for 10 minutes. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Walker, for being here. And I thank my colleagues for the questions they've asked. We had a hearing on December 7, 1999. Uh, the purpose of the hearing was to examine how the Air Force implemented cost control strategies and dealt with scheduled overruns in the F-22 program. We had a hearing on June 15, 2000. Uh, the purpose of the hearing was to examine the status of the Air Force production costs reduction plans in the F-22 program. We had a hearing in August 2, 2001. The purpose of that hearing was to continue the subcommittee's examination of production cost reduction plans for the F-22 program and to determine why the DOD and the Air Force were projecting different production cost estimates. 
And then we are having a hearing April 11th, 2003. And I was thinking that we have kind of missed a gap here, uh, but when I look at the hearing we had, the third hearing, it was August 2nd, 2001. And uh, something quite significant happened on September 11th, 2001. But this is a hugely important hearing. Uh, it's hugely important, in my judgment, uh, for just the terms of what we can learn in the process and how we can see what happens in the future. And it's very important based on uh, uh, the actual program itself. And uh, I agree with my colleague, Mr. Schrock, that we need the plane. I also agree with Mr. Tierney that this is short of an outrage uh, to go from 750 planes in 91 to six, in 91 to make it 648, to 438 in 93, to 339 in 97, to 333 in 99, to 276 in 2002, to maybe 224 today, and not get the same numbers from the Air Force and from DOD. And frankly, the arrogance of not their, their lack of willingness to tell us how many planes. For instance, I will want to know from the Air Force how many planes can they build under the, uh, the cap of 36 billion, 36.8 billion? That's what I want to know. The other thing I want to know is I want to know why we can do with 276 or 224. Um, what planes are they replacing? It's the F-15. Mr. Walker, is that the only plane that would be replaced by this? It'd be a because of the age of the F-117s, the attack version of the F-A-22 would also enable them to uh, replace the F-117s. So am I to make an assumption, though, that when we're done, we will have replaced all those planes with a number of 224 or 276? No. <laughs> and so what am I to assume? And what is the Air Force assuming? Well, that's, that's why I say that I believe you need a business case. You need to demand a business case uh, and, and to try to understand that. I, I think what's been happening is is that the numbers have just been going down in order to uh, fit whatever appropriation is there, and that's not the way to do it. Okay. Well, I, I think that's fairly obvious. I just wanted that on the record. And so the challenge I have, Mr. Schrock, is coming to grips with the fact that I think that we have a DOD and Air Force that is not cooperating with the committee or Congress and helping us sort out this mess. And it has become a gigantic mess. In terms of process in general, I'm, I'm intrigued by the evolutionary approach uh, uh, versus the so-called revolutionary approach. And I'm, I'm interested that you make the claim, evidently, uh, Mr. Walker, that we would, have had, we would have planes, some of the F-22s would be in operation today, that they would cost less and we'd be able to buy more of them. That's really what you're saying to us. But I don't understand how you get there. Well, basically what it comes down to, Mr. Chairman, is um, I would characterize that what happened on the F-22 is in 1986, we were in a very different security environment. We faced very different adversaries. Uh, the Air Force decided that we needed to maintain air superiority over time and therefore developed this F-22 concept. Uh, the concept was to a great extent based upon wants rather than uh, not just needs, and there was some need, there's no question, but also wants. Uh, and they, ha they, I, they wanted to design the Rolls-Royce, as was mentioned. You know, why can't we do this? Wouldn't it be nice if we had this? And even when they came up with that, the definition of this evolved over time. Uh, my point is, is that Spiral development says, what type of capabilities do you need versus what, would you, what do you want, which you may not need? And it says, determine what those capabilities are and start to build systems uh, in, in an evolutionary approach where you end up you know, maybe getting an 80% solution for the first batch, uh, and then you end up, as technologies mature, you get a 90% solution for the second batch, and you get a 100% solution for the third batch. This is oversimplifying it, but that's basically the concept. Rather than putting you know, all your money in trying to build the Rolls-Royce when technologies have not, been, you know, have, not been, have not matured, experiencing significant problems, 
uh, having to deal with, you know, retrograde, retrofit, and, and all these other issues, uh, it's just not the way to do it. It's not the way it's done uh, in best practices. It's not the way it should be done at DOD. One of the most instructive uh, points that was made to me by a, a, a congressman who's no longer here, uh, but when I was a newer member, he said, the decisions you make in defense, and he was saying that to me as a new member, given that I was in a state house of representatives, and the one area that was totally new to me was defense expenditures. And he said to me, whatever decision you make today will, will only have impact 10 years later, or basically, not only. But at the early, yeah, in a sense, he was saying, what I do today is going to impact the, the military of 10 years and beyond. And, and so uh, in 90, 1991, I was thinking, Thank, and we were fighting the Gulf War, I was thinking, thank gosh, that people in the early 80s and late 70s made us look good in 91. I'm a member of Congress, but I'd only been in for four years. Um, <clears throat> he also told me something else. He told me, our job in Congress is to make sure it's never a fair fight. That my job is to make sure when your son is in battle, he has the best equipment and the best training. And, and, and that's my job. And, and we never want it to be a fair fight. So what I'm thinking right now is we could keep the F-15 and we are still slightly superior. Uh, the Russians, that's the one area that they seem to do well is make planes. The French make a pretty good plane. And so I'm going through this kind of dialogue. Is this my, you know, a moment of truth for us? Uh, is this what makes sure it's never a fair fight? But now, looking at the war, uh, right now we control the air, and I'm wondering, uh, so we didn't need fighter to fighter in, in, in this war. Um, and I'm wondering when we'll need it. And so it strikes me, one, we have to monitor what other planes are being, are being made. Sorry for this long introduction, but I believe in the concept of opportunity cost, which is what was you know, drilled into me in graduate school. And that was the clear concept that if you spend your money here, you're not going to be able to spend it here. And I would say to Ms. Maloney that it's not just an issue of opportunity costs in terms of education and so on. It's within DOD. They're going to have to make some really tough decisions. So it gets to me to this question. In your judgment, Mr. Walker, are we so far along that uh, it makes sense just even if we can only make 200 and 24 planes, does it make sense for us to continue, uh, given all the investment we've made, so the opportunity cost is, you know, we've kind of already been at the opportunity cost level? Well, the opportunity cost is what I refer to as the ripple effect. <laughs> you know, if, thing, if you have negative variances, what is the ripple effect of that negative variance? My personal view is and we're already making the plane. We're in limited production right now, so we're going to have some F-22s. I think the real question is, I believe the business case needs to be focused on how many do we need, for what purpose, at what cost, and with what ripple effect. Looking forward with regard to 10 years from now or more, what, what do we think we're going to face? Uh, and that's what I think has to be done. How many that is, I don't know. I wouldn't want to speculate. Uh, but it should be based on a need, not a want, so and not a plug. But in one sense, it should we should almost separate the cost out and have a very uh, studied approach as to you, you are replacing some plane. How many planes are you needing to replace? So technically, what number you need? It might even lead you, <coughs> potentially, I mean, I wouldn't make the assumption now, that you would rebuild a plane that we've made in the past at a lower cost and make the F-22. I mean, we don't know that, right? Or, or is no, you, you, could, you could decide that you might make some adjusted number of the F-22, which is, you know, obviously the most advanced system that, that is uh, on the drawing board right now, uh, and redeploy some of those dollars, keep it in defense, and redeploy it to buy larger quantities of either existing systems that have been upgraded or the JSF or whatever. I mean, that's not my job. I can't do that. But, I, but those, that's part of the analysis that has to happen here. We can't look at these programs in isolation. We can't be wedded to what we, th we, we, we wanted years ago and what we may or may not need today. Thank you. I, I noticed that we have another colleague. My time has run out, and uh, I do thank you for uh, all your good work on this and other issues. 
And uh, I will say to you that I think that this committee will uh, uh, devote some time to, to the whole concept of uh, that is being done now, but examine it in other programs and maybe ask you to show us some cases that are working well in the evolutionary versus the revolutionary. And we do have some of those, and I think it's important to note those for the record. I'd also like to would thank you, you would, Mr. Would, Chairman, for allowing me to have Mr. Lee here with me, who's on the point for our F-22 effort. Right. Well, you have good people working for you, and he's one of them. And let me say it differently. You only look good because of your good people. We're only as good as our people, Mr. Exactly. Chairman. We all know that. Okay. And I got a great committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chase. Chair, recognize Mr. Bell for 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I want to commend Chairman Shays and R Ranking Member Kucinich for uh, their leadership on this issue, as well as Representative Tierney, who I know has uh, demonstrated commitment over the years to uh, the issue. For just a moment, I want to focus on uh, the past, since sometimes it can be uh, a good guide to the future, and more specifically, some of the risks that GAO had identified several years back um, with a program such as technical problems. And if you could, Mr. Walker, if you could tell us how uh, those problems that uh, were identified were addressed and tell us if it's uh, fair to say that a lot of the problems that were pointed out by GAO were successfully addressed. We, we, have, we have appointed I uh, pointed out a number of problems in the past. I'll, I'll answer briefly and then ask Mr. Lee to uh, provide some additional details since he's been involved with this a, long, a lot longer than I have. The basic problem that we found is the failure to follow commercial best practices with regard to the maturity of technology before you move in, you, but between different stages, design to development to limited production, for example. That's the basic problem. There have been avionics problems. There have been uh, various aspects that I would ask Alan to get into as to what some of the details are there, but that's... Can you talk about how they were addressed? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I can. Uh, thank you for your question. Indeed, the Air Force, um, in, in the various reports that we have identified, we identified problems, for example, with their canopy, the fact that uh, cracks were occurring in the canopy. That has since been resolved. Uh, we had identified uh, this year, we're identifying issues regarding the fin buffeting issue, and they have said that they have a fix to that. The fix that they have has been demonstrated above 10,000 feet. Under 10,000 feet has still not been demonstrated. So while that shows their commitment and their progress, they have not finished that. And the last thing I would, would uh, identify is avionics. We have identified that as an issue and a, as a problem area for several years, and that still remains a problem. Uh, Dr. Sega and Dr. Samber are uh, in the midst right now of trying to resolve those problems. They think they have a fix to some of those avionics problems. It's going to take a few months for them to get that resolved. Looking back at the past for a guide and, and moving forward to the March 2003 report, do you think it's fair to say that uh, given the, the past response, that there will be a similar response to the problems identified uh, in the 2003 report, or are we talking about a different set of hurdles that, that simply can't be overcome? I, I don't have a crystal ball to be able to identify whether or not in the operational test and evaluation something will crop up. I am encouraged by the fact that the Air Force is responsive to our, the identification of problems and is trying to find solutions to them. And I want to go, Mr. Walker, I want to go back. When you were talking about the question uh, of how many and, and trying to determine how many uh, will be needed, uh, how would you recommend going about figuring that out and, and basing it on what? Well, first, I think intellectually what we ought to be doing is figuring out what the, we ought to be looking at current and expected future threats, which presumably should be part of the national security strategy. Uh, that then should translate to the national military strategy. That should then translate to uh, what type of capabilities do we think we'll need at what relative time frames to be able to do that, uh, and uh, also uh, what, what relative quantities we think we'll need, not just to replace what we have, because the number that we have may not be what we need. I mean, the number that we have 
and had for the Cold War era may not be the appropriate number that we need for the future. Uh, and so uh, my view is, is that uh, there's a need to, uh, to fundamentally step back and to say not what, we, what path we committed to in 1986, that we're still basically going down. The only difference is how many of those are we going to buy and when are we going to get them. We need to take this point and look forward and say what type of capabilities do we need and what relative quantities. And if you assume that the Defense Department is going to have a budget cap, which I think is a reasonable assumption given our long-range budget simulations, then for them to make more conscious trade-offs as to what the long-term effect might be on JSF, what might be on space systems, and what, uh, what the effect might be on other military services as well. I don't think that's happened. Now, I will say for the record that the Defense Department is doing a better job on evolutionary, uh, ev evolutionary development. I will also say they're doing a better job of matching the POM, which is the program planning, with the budget, but they're only looking out two years. You need to look much longer than two years because the, the, the ripple effect on some of these things gets much greater over time. Well, I was going to ask you that. How often do you think that assessment needs to, to be made in, in terms of how many? How, how, many, how often should we be coming back to that question? Because I think what you're recommending is a, a pretty large degree of flexibility based on what's going on. Well, I, I, I would respectfully suggest that uh, I'm not aware that it's been done in years. Uh, and so it would be good to start with once. <laughs> then after that, I would suggest that uh, we look at the changing environment. If there are material subsequent events, uh, in, in, in the global condition, in the security condition, in, you know, in, in our budget situation or whatever, then, then it might make sense to relook at it. But we need to start with once. So when you say it hasn't ever been done, do you believe it was always done in a, some, as far as fixing the number was always done in somewhat arbitrary fashion? Well, I, don't, I don't believe that it was arbitrary. I believe that it was, it was a plug. It's not arbitrary. I mean, in fairness, now, this is not the only plug. I mean, I, I, I am the audit partner on the consolidated financial statements of the U.S. government. There was a $17.1 billion plug uh, in coming up with the last audited financial statements with the U.S. government. So this is not the only plug that exists in government, and that's real money, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We have... Um, 11 minutes to go. I'm going to recognize Mr. Platts, uh, but you probably won't want to use your full 10 minutes. <laughs> Mr. Thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, I'll be very brief. Um, I uh, appreciate the focus of the subcommittee on this issue, and thank goodness uh, for C-SPAN radio as I was delayed uh, because of the weather and traffic accident and getting in here this morning. I got to hear most of the uh, testimony from, from Mr. Walker and questions. So. Uh, I uh, appreciate that opportunity uh, th via the radio. Um, Mr. Walker, I, I do have uh, maybe just one question. I appreciate your testimony um, previously in uh, the subcommittee on government efficiency and financial management. And one of the things we talked about there was a chief financial officer, a career position, uh, perhaps a 10-year term or so to try to have some uh, better direction. Would that type of position translate to a benefit in what uh, some of the problems we saw here from the financial management side of, uh, of the uh, um, Raptor program if we had that type of position in place today? As you know, uh, there's a level two position, uh, the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisitions. Uh, my, my personal view is, is that the importance of the acquisitions process and all related activities and the amounts of money involved clearly justify having a level two person focused full time on those issues. The position that you're referring to that we talked about a couple of days ago was GAO has talked about the fact that we believe it may be appropriate for the Department of Defense and certain other selected entities who have had years of problems in dealing with basic management infrastructure items. You know, things like financial management, information technology, knowledge management, these types of issues, procurement. Uh, to have a chief operating officer, chief management officials at the level two level who would be responsible for planning, integration, and execution uh, of the, the dealing with the issues that frankly just don't get dealt with under our current structure. I mean, DOD has 
uh, six of the high-risk areas on GAO's high-risk list, plus each one of the government-wide areas that they're, they're subject to. Uh, I think you need to consider having somebody with proven experience and track record on that with something like a seven-year term with a performance contract uh, who could stay focused on the things that need to be done, including the cultural transformation efforts, which based on my, my experience in the public and private sector, when you're talking about cultural transformation, it takes seven plus years to make it work and make it stick. We don't have anybody who sticks around that long. You know, and with all the turnover just on the acquisitions part that I showed before, and I'm not saying you need seven years for a program manager, but for this type of position, the chief operating officer, chief management official, I think it makes eminent good sense and I think it would help tremendously at the Department of Defense to deal with a lot of these high-risk areas and help improve economy efficiency, effectiveness, and accountability. Thank you, Mr. Walker, and, and Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and um, my hope is, is through some of the efforts of the uh, Government Efficiency Financial Management Subcommittee working with Chairman Shays that um, we'll have that cultural change that will benefit not just the FA-22 program and, and how that's going forward, but uh, DOD in total. And Mr. Platts, as you know, you're familiar with the $17.1 billion plug that we talked about we, a couple of days ago, we, right? We had a good discussion about that, that plug. Uh, and uh, as you said, it, it, it is real money, and trying to account for it is uh, somewhat challenging, apparently, uh, right now uh, for the Treasury. So thank you. I thank the gentleman. Um, Mr. Walk uh, Mr. Walker, we thank you for your testimony. You've uh, made it very clear to us in other hearings where we've dealt with cost overruns, uh, programs, uh, technology that isn't working, and so on, uh, that we need a chief operating officer, chief management officers. Uh, they need to have continuity. And, and I'll just emphasize, as I've looked at this political process, that the, 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 these, these, are the deputy, these, these are deputy positions that sometimes uh, they're not assigned when a president takes over for a year. Uh, they may take another year to go through the process. And so they're in office for about two years, and Lord knows who's doing those positions during the, the transition. Um, so we look forward to working with you on that issue in general. Let me just ask, is there anything you need to put on the record before we adjourn? No, Mr. Before Chairman, we I recess, don't. I'm sorry. No, there's not, but I would mention one thing. We do right now, as you know, at DOD, you have two level two positions that I'm aware of. You have the Deputy Secretary and you have the Under Secretary for Acquisitions. I would respectfully suggest that they both have full-time jobs. And so what I'm talking about is a, another level two person who would be this chief operating officer or management official in order to deal with these basic infrastructure items. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Let me uh, say to our next panelists that uh, we're going to expect from DOD and from the Air Force that they tell us without any reluctance uh, how many planes they can build uh, with the statutory cap of $36.8 billion. That is the And we uh, will welcome Mr. Weick, uh, Michael Wynn, Principal Deputy Under Secretary of Defense, Acquisitions Department of Defense, and Dr. Uh, Marvin Samber, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force Acquisition Department of the Air Force Department of uh, Defense. And, um, to say that I, I, I know that uh, Mr. Wynn in particular has an import, important meeting with some of our uh, uh, congressional colleagues at 3, and we will definitely get you out of here uh, 15 minutes before. Uh, and uh, who knows, maybe sooner. If you give us all the right answers, you can be out of here real quick. <laughs> you know, and the right answers are just the honest answers. Uh, and I don't mean that you wouldn't be honest, but in other words, uh, if we can get right to the point, we will probably cover a lot. Uh, I need to swear both of you in, and if you'd rise, please. Raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, I would uh, note before calling on you, Mr. Wynn, that this is an issue that uh, uh, basically goes from one administration to another administration to another administration. And, um, uh, but uh, ultimately, uh, right now, both of you are are in uh, command of this program, uh, have responsibilities, and we are just trying to understand where we are, where we're going, and the logic to, uh, you know, to both issues, and to, uh, to be clear as to what a contribution our committee can make. So, uh, Mr. Wynn, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you.
Is your mic on, sir? You should see a red a light go on there. Better. Yeah. Better? That's perfect. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm pleased to come before you today to talk about the F-22 program and the acquisition that is and has been managing the cost, schedule, and technical aspects that together make a program that has as its goal to bring to the defense of America the best tactical fighter aircraft that this country has ever produced. The aircraft now designated the F-A-22 has characteristics to address the threat to our freedom for many years into the future. Though this aspect is not the direct thrust of this hearing, it is important to keep the purpose of the acquisition in mind as we progress. Secretary Aldridge sent out five goals as we set out to improve the acquisition process in general, and the first among them was the restoration of the credibility in the budgeting process to gain your confidence that year after year, cost increases on weapon systems could in fact be minimized. This provided an opportunity for the inclusion of the independent cost estimate in the determination of annual and program budgets, reconciling differences and making informed judgment if there were variances between the independent cost estimate and the program budget. This policy has been, has in effect, has in fact led to dramatic reduction in cost-driven changes and allowed some focus and stability on other areas that impact cost, such as technical risk and changes in quantity. The FA-22 program, which has been in existence for some time prior to this policy, had in fact suffered from previous steps to manage costs using caps for R&D and caps for production. The cap for research and development had the program coping with inadequate test articles and a single consolidated avionics integration laboratory, as well as a clear erosion in the area of systems engineering, which appeared on the surface to be redundant engineering on this highly integrated weapon systems. During this same period, the acquisition workforce was being steadily downsized. Program offices were directed to be of a certain size in attempting to comply with downsizing pressure yet expected to retain the fiduciary, financial, and legal oversight. This led to a reduction in analytic engineering capability within the program offices in general, and for, in particular, the FA-22 program office in the area of systems engineering and integration. This pressure continues and has the potential to introduce yet more risk in the process. The areas that suffer are areas that seem redundant when things go well, and then seem essential when things don't. Discipline systems engineering is, is essential as software and integrated systems are becoming the vogue for defense. Two million lines of diversified distributed software code are being integrated for the FA and 22, and six million are forecast for the Joint Strike Fighter, and I believe triple that again for the future combat systems in total. I have spoken out on the need for increased systems engineering in the community at large and firmly believe that as we have addressed the cost risk, we must also address technical risk by restoring and agreeing to pay for our supplier capability in this critical skill area. And within our own community, stop the erosion of our capability to be smart buyers. Here we have turned to another capable group, the federally funded research and development centers, to assist in reviewing the current crop of problems and advise us on a good path forward. Although their primary role is in research and not troubleshooting, they are also great sources for talented engineers who can and have helped. I would ask that as you deliberate the complex budget, that you consider them as yet another part of the engineering talent pool that the department has to draw on and that has over time been reduced in numbers using the rubric of budgetary savings and often accused of being redundant to the department workforce. I digress to emphasize that we are here today talking about an effect, cost increase for specific weapon systems, and recognize that to get at it in a systematic way, we must as well look at all the causes. For if we are blind to the causes, then we are destined to confront the same issues in another forum like this. As one author put it, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes well. Turning to the present situation with the FNA 22, 
we have a case where the airframe has been proven to be superior in its characteristics while the software lags in development. The FA-22 is meeting or exceeding the key performance parameters regarding aircraft performance. Flight testing to date demonstrates the capabilities that meet the requirements for the air combat warriors. Thus far, the structural fix within, with the titanium substitute for carbon graphite has in fact provided additional structural strength, reducing the risk of fin buffet for the aircraft that the GAO refers to in their report. And it appears to be an acceptable fix. Yes, testing in the harsher environment below the 10,000 foot altitude currently scheduled for June has not been accomplished, but it is not expected to change that outlook according to the computer simulations that have been accomplished. From a technical risk perspective, this leaves the highest risk area, the integration of the software and the embedded instabilities being discovered in the avionics software. At our request and with great cooperation from the Air Force, the Director of Defense Research and Engineering formed the avionics advisory team made up of software experts from DOD, academia, and industry to do two primary tasks. First, to identify underlying systemic flaws and to advise OSD as, as to the likelihood of a fix requiring a major change to the avionics architecture and or the flight weapons control computers. Second, they were identifying impediments to resolving the issue and provide suggested approaches to the Air Force and contractor design teams. Let me address each in turn. First, the team reported that they have not uncovered any evidence that the architecture is fatally flawed. And they added that radical change to the architecture would likely make it harder, not easier, to resolve the underlying software integration issue in any kind of a timely manner. Second, the team identified systems engineering concerns which likely contributed to the problem and troubleshooting software tools that they suggested would help reduce the schedule for resolution. The FA-22 has embraced the avionics advisory team's recommendations in the areas which assist in detecting and correcting root causes for the software instabilities. The Air Force, as you will hear, has allocated 60 additional days to this resolution process. We want dedicated independent operational testing and evaluation to be an event-driven, not schedule-driven, and have established some objective criteria representing the product we want for the Air Combat Warrior. This includes a runtime stability measure, which will allow testing to be performed in an efficient manner. While we are encouraged by recent reports of progress, we remain concerned about meeting the criterion within the allocated 60 days. We have scheduled a review in mid-June to determine courses of action to best address all of our concerns. And we are following the FNA 22 design team's progress. I have been briefed recently on actions in progress which, if accomplished, should make a difference. That having been said, I have to be skeptical until hard metrics allow me to be otherwise. On behalf of all the men and women in uniform, I want to thank you for your support and encouragement, which led to the magnificent performance of our total force thus far. I am prepared to address your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. At this time, we'll recognize Dr. Samber. Thank you. Good afternoon, Congress. Is, is your mic on, sir? I believe it is. Okay, thank you. It is thank on. You. My apology. That's fine. Good afternoon, Chairman Chase, Ranking Member Cherney, and Congressman Schrock. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss with you the Air Force's efforts and progress on acquisition reform. Mr. Wynn and I are proud to come before you today and discuss our acquisition reform policies to increase agility and provide cre credibility in the cost and schedule of our development programs. Our intent is not to make excuses for our performance of the past, but rather to spell out what we are doing to significantly improve our future performance. The Secretary and Chief of Staff of the Air Force gave me a mandate to improve the way we do business in delivering capabilities to the warfighter. From slipping development times to reducing deliveries to increased costs, programs have not met established baselines and goals. During this past year, I have been working to determine the root cause of these execution problems. The findings identify several factors that lead to poor performance, including unstable requirements, faulty cost estimates, 
lack of test community buy-in, inadequate systems engineering, and unstable funding. For the Air Force, these program execution problems result in the average cost growth of 30 percent and an average development time of nearly 10 years. Given the problems noted above and the resulting increases in program costs and delays in program schedules, I have formulated a series of policies to address the underlying causes. These policies, as they say, are in violent agreement with those you heard this morning from Mr. Walker. First, in order to overcome our inadequate requirements process, I have implemented an agile acquisition policy. Me, could you just um, make sure uh, you said violent agreement. Agreement. A, a violent disagreement or a viol violent agreement, meaning I concur. Okay. I'm sorry if I said it incorrectly. Oh, no, you said it, you said it exactly correctly. It's just the word violent is a word usually associated with disagreement. Sometimes in the uh, yeah, but in this way, case, that means that agree, you're in a strong agreement. I agree with the policies uh, for improvements for the future. In particular, uh, in order to overcome our inadequate requirements process, I've implemented an agile acquisition policy that demands collaboration. That is active, cooperative dialogue between the warfighter, acquirers, engineers, and testers. This creates a team from the outset and throughout the requirements and development process. This team approach results in a true understanding and buy-in to the requirements and leads to a stable requirement foundation. As the policy states, it encourages spiral approach and is opposed to the Big Bang that you heard this morning. Second, not having test community buy-in created problems within the acquisition process. To resolve this issue, we are developing a seamless verification process to ensure that both the development test and operation tests occur in a single process. If the operational testers are involved early in the process, then they can assess the operational value of development testing and reduce the duplication of effort. Third, we need to instill a strong systems engineering foundation within the acquisition process. I have implemented a process by which all future milestone decision authorities will not sign out any future acquisition strategy plans that lack the necessary attention to systems engineering. Additionally, I am demanding that systems engineering performance be linked to contract award fees and to the incentive fee structure. Fourth, unstable funding is a constant problem one that will be better managed by instituting a more disciplined program priority process and by insisting on the use of spiral development methods. We have had several successes based on these new policies and procedures. One such example is the passive attack weapon. This met weapon was developed as a result of a 180 de degree, uh, day quick reaction program at Air Combat Command. It was available to the warfighter at the 90-day mark. Other successes are detailed in my written statement. As the paramount reason for your subcommittee meeting is the poor performance of the FA-22, I will also give you a status update on the program. Again, my intent is not to justify the programmatic performance, but rather to give you an appreciation of some of the changes we have made and the positive improvements that have resulted. It's been a busy year for both the development and production phases of the FA-22 program, and I'm pleased to let you know we've made tremendous strides in both. We have seven Raptors flying almost daily at Edwards Air Force Base. These jets have accumulated over 3,000 flying hours to date. In the summer of last year, we reorganized and we made changes so that we could execute the envelope expansion testing in order to clear the full 9G point. We put a new plan in place and we've been executing a two and a half fold increase to our testing rate over the past six months. We've successfully fired 16 missiles, four of which were guided. It is important to note that one of these shots was an AMRAAM shot at Super Cruise. In the future, we will drop JDAM at Super Cruise. 
To prove the strength and durability of the airframe itself, we completed static and first lifetime of fatigue testing. These tests traditionally uncover potential redesign or retrofit issues. But very importantly, we found no, let me repeat that, no major issues from either test. This program tackled technologies others have never faced, and we're getting it done. We're attacking avionic stability the same way. We've made fundamental changes in our avionic development effort, and I'm confident, very confident, that resolution of avionic stability will be resolved in the future. In our production program, we're also getting it right. The operation on the production floor at Marietta is rapidly gaining momentum. As expected in our production program, in its infancy, we've had growing pains which have manifested themselves in late aircraft deliveries. To address these late deliveries, we've been working closely with Mont Lockheed Martin to implement a number of initiatives for reducing build cycle time. The changes we're putting in place are making very visible impacts. During calendar year 2000 alone, Lockheed reduced late aircraft deliveries from 12 months late to seven months late. At the current rate of improvement, we expect aircraft deliveries to be back on contract schedule by July 2004 at aircraft 4035. Cost is also important to us. That is why we are very focused on production affordability. One visible way we're striving for more is through the production cost reduction program. We've invested $475 million including $85 million in fiscal year 2004 in producibility improvements. When we first established this program, we said we would invest $475 million. We have not wavered from that commitment. I think it is important to recognize that the ground we're paving on the Raptor in many ways enables our future force. The FA-22 is developing and implementing state-of-the-art technology, fusing leading-edge capabilities and pioneering manufacturing techniques that will ultimately yield not only the world's greatest aircraft, but will also establish an invaluable set of lessons learned for developing future complex war weapon systems. The FA-22's unique combination of capabilities complement and increase the effectiveness of the entire joint forces. The FA-22 is the kick down the door system. It establishes air dominance. It opens the door for our follow-on persistence forces. It makes, as you said this morning, Chairman Shays, an unfair fight. The Raptor is the pathfinder. We have to get it right. The Raptor will propagate the American standard of air dominance for the decades to come. In summary, the Air Force remains focused on providing the necessary capabilities to the warfighter in order to win America's wars. These capabilities can only be achieved through effective and efficient management during the development, production, and fielding of systems. By incorporating a strong collaborative process, implementing spiral development, and infusing systems engineering in our acquisition process, we can overcome the tough challenges ahead. We are committed to pursuing these actions necessary to make transformation work. I appreciate the support provided by Congress, and I look forward to working with this committee to best satisfy our warfighters' needs in the future. Again, thank you for the opportunity to provide this statement, and I will be glad to answer any questions. I thank both of you. I um, want to say we're going to be able, there are just three committee members and the two of you, we're going to be able to really sort this out. So, uh, uh, you know, I, my point to you is that um, Right now, I, I, it's not sorted out for me. And, and a, a little disappointed with one aspect of your testimony, uh, I had hoped that you would basically, either one or both of you, tell us what our $36.8 billion would buy if we have the cap. So, um, and Mr. Tierney, you know, was mentioning to me, you know, in spite of our request to that, uh, we're still not getting that. Um, so you, you forced me just to ask the question. I hope you would voluntarily do it. So, Mr. Wynn, uh, how many aircraft will we get for the, um, the $36.8 uh, $36 billion? 
Sir, my estimate, and it is an estimate because it's we've only produced seven so far, and it does depend upon whether or not the predicted cost reduction projects come into being and impact these airplanes. And it does depend upon how such a lower reduced uh, quantity would be planned out, whether you'd get more or less inflation, et cetera. But I estimate the impact to be between 225 and 235 airplanes would be achievable, uh, again, depending upon how uh, the cost reductions uh, would be impacted. I have not uh, conducted a, a um, thorough review, but I have a lot of uh, time in, in the world of estimating. This is not too bad. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dr. Sandberg, what would your estimate be? I think um, uh, Mr. Wynn is about correct, okay. about the 225. Now, range. sort this out for me. Um, first off, uh, as I usually do in hearings, I, in order to learn, I have to expose my ignorance. But I have forgotten uh, as to uh, this is to replace the F-15, but is it also to replace some F-16s? Is this uh, solely going to be Air Force? I think by looking at it as a replacement uh, jet, you're looking at it from the wrong way. This is basically a technology leap forward to uh, counter the threats we perceive and are actually happening not right now in um, Let me ask you this. Who's going to use the plane, Air Force or Navy, or both? Air Force. Okay. So uh, do, does the Air Force uh, fly any F six, uh, F-16s? The Air Force flies the F-16. Yeah. And the F-15s? Yes. So uh, it is basically, um, uh, and the Navy does not fly either? No. Okay. It flies the F-18. F-18. F it specifically F flies the F-14s and, and the F-18s. Th uh, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. The, um, uh, but when I look at the, 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 the complement that we have now, we have um, approximately 1,600, give or take. What, what is going to replace uh, those planes as they wear down? We're not going to go from 1,600 to 235, even taking your high estimate. So what plane takes, what, t what takes the place of that plane? Of both we have a fairly comprehensive look into the future uh, on um, tactical aviation, and, and we are concerned, as you indicate, that the uh, cost of uh, replacement aircraft has uh, caused us to, to th reconsider uh, tactics, strategy, et cetera. Uh, right now, we are forecasting that we can extend the life of the FN-18 as well as the, um, the F-15, F-16 until the Joint Strike Fighter uh, becomes aboard. You asked a great question, if I could follow on, sir, about uh, what airplane does the F-22 replace. I would liken it to uh, making sure that we have air dominance as we have achieved air dominance over every projected threat that we can see in the future. Right now, uh, it is not limited uh, to the population of Iraq, as we were often accused of fighting the last war. We are actually, in this case, looking forward to the next war. That having been the case, I would say that the F-117 F is the, probably the most reflective of the capabilities we have, but it is not an air-to-air -air or an air-to-ground. It is, but it does do some of those missions. Okay. I, um, I'm still, um, it would strike me that almost any reasonable person would conclude, first off, since September 11th, we have used, we have used this, these, these airframes in lots of different ways, uh, the, the fly zone north and south. Uh, uh, we, are, we are using these planes to fly uh, periodically over, over cities. This, this, this aircraft, both the F-15 uh, uh, and 16, have gotten in a tremendous amount of use in the last few years. And I'm told that it's much like a race car. You, you bring an airliner in uh, from overseas, it, it just turns around in a few hours and goes back, and it might come back again. It just is, it's a real workhorse. Uh, it is, it's, it's not this kind of high performance. But I'm told that, that our fighter aircraft are high performance and wear out quickly and, and parts have to be, be replaced quite often. 
So what I need to know is, um, maybe more from you, Mr. Wynn, uh, are we looking then at replacing the F-15 and F-16 with more of those planes, building more of them? I mean, is that a, a We are, or I think we are continuing to, uh, to buy uh, the F-15 and the F-16. I think they are planned to be in our uh, fleet uh, for many, many years to come, if not uh, decades. Uh, as far as their capability is concerned, uh, they are not anywhere close to be as capable as the FNA-22 or the Joint Strike Fighter when it comes on stream. So longer term, I would say that they will be replaced, and they will be replaced with a combination of the FNA-22 and the Joint Strike Fighter. When we went down from, two f uh, from 750 in 91 to 648 and 93 to 438 and 97 to 339 and to 99 to 333 and... 2002 to 276, and while it's not certain that we would go at the cap, I mean, it's possible Congress will decide to increase the cap level, but if we went with the cap level of 235, what, what did we have in its place as we kept bringing these numbers down and, and the, the um, amount of time it took to, to build the F-22? What did we do? Did we, did we just leave this gap, or have can we... I, can yeah. Can I just have an opportunity to answer that? I'd like to correct sure. uh, one of the uh, answers. Can you put your mic down a little lower? I think we'll hear you better. Thank okay. you. Okay, is that fine? Yeah. Okay, I'd like to correct uh, one of the things that Mr. Wynn said. We are not in the process of building F-15s and F-16s. We're, we're doing some enhancements to them, uh, but we're not in the process of doing that. Earlier this morning, you heard a plea from uh, Mr. Walker about a business plan. We have made that business plan, as you probably recognize, uh, about several months ago. Uh, there was a concern within the Department of Defense as to whether or not the F-A-22 was the right way to go, and they challenged the Air Force to actually prove the viability of this plane for the future, whether or not it was meeting the needs, whether or not we had an adequate plan forward. So we actually presented uh, to the DOD a comprehensive business plan that included uh, the requirements that we felt that this F-A-22 needed to meet, a business plan that talked about the aging assets of the F-15, and it was very comprehensive. Obviously, some of it is classified, but some of the business a aspects are open, and you can uh, obviously share that. We'd be happy to share those parts that are not classified with you. Thank you. Um, the bottom line is it's good that we have that business plan. It needs to be, I think, shared with the appropriate committees, right. including this committee as well. Let me just say to you both that um, uh, you're certain both to appear before us again. Because sure. uh, we're going to continue. We, we missed uh, one step along the way after September 11th, but we're going to be back monitoring this. And we know that, that you all um, are newer to the program. Um, but I think you can recognize there needs to be some, you know, a, a, a sense of statements made and then an assessment of how we're doing on those. Well, as you said at the beginning, the right way to testify is to tell the truth. We're telling you, as we see it, we recognize the issues you have, and they're good issues. And as I said in my testimony, I'm not here to give you excuses for performance in the past, which has not been exactly great, to use that expression. And we're trying to make improvements for the future. And the point that we're trying to make here, at least from the Air Force's point of view, is that we've taken a comprehensive look at the need for this FA-22 and have balanced it with all of our other needs and felt that this is the way to go forward. We're not happy with the number of 224 if the cap is not lifted or 276. You know, we feel that we need something in the order of 381. Uh, and as we see stability on this program and we get some of these processes in place, we hope to see improvement. And I will be very happy to appear before you uh, in the future and really uh, show you what we've done and, and uh, be accountable if we've not been there. Fair enough. Let me say that one of our, in our third panel, we have a witness who believes that the number to stay within the cap will be closer to 175. And uh, the per unit cost of that almost becomes, in his words, uh, manifestly absurd. I, uh, it's very possible that, you know, I mean, obviously in this business plan, it will share with us if we built, say, um, 300 
what the per unit cost would be. I mean, I would imagine that you're giving uh, people, decision makers, certain options as to absolutely, yeah, and also uh, what it's going to, what what our number is, regardless of the cost, what we need. Let me say, Mr. Chairman, that the type of uh, questioning that you're giving to me and to Mr. Wynn is not unheard of within the DOD itself. There is a tremendous amount of questionings associated with this program, and the Air Force has time and time again been asked to prove whether or not this is the right way forward. And we've had lots of exercises like this, a lot of data we've brought forward. And if I may, I'd like to correct some of the impressions that you heard this morning on the GAA report with respect to the 1.3 billion, which I think there was some confusion on that. Uh, basically, the question was whether or not the Air Force has accounted for that in our latest numbers. And let me just make sure what those items are that were uh, claimed to have been missing by the GAO. Uh, the first was whether or not we would get the multi-year procurement in a timely fashion as we had projected. Because if you don't get a multi-year procurement, your costs will go up. We've actually were much more conservative. We assumed that we would not get a multi-year until 2007. The second concern in the GAO report was whether or not we would reap benefits from the JSF program, which had a lot of commonality with the AF. A22. We assumed a minimal amount. We actually were very uh, conservative in that. There also was a claim about inflation that we did not adequately put in enough for inflation due to some of the schedule moving forward. We also put that in. And proof of the fact that our estimates are now more conservative is that for the first time, almost first time ever, the CAG, which is the independent cost group within the DOD, now substantiates the Air Force number. It's highly unusual when the keg actually comes in and says, yes, the services have actually done a good job uh, in validating their number. And we had a chance to yeah, meet I, I'm going to, uh, again, ad admit my ignorance. And I thank my colleagues for giving me, uh, uh, going beyond my 10 minutes, and I will be very generous with their time as well. But just tell me, when you say K, I'm, I'm Cost analysis. Uh, keg. CAIG, C-A-I-G. Uh, and that's the cost analysis independent group. It is a function within the, uh, the DOD to give an independent look at the services cost estimates. Okay. Uh, historically and almost every time, those if estimates differ. In this case, they uh, corroborated and agreed with our numbers. Uh, and we went through a very thorough exercise to make sure that we accounted for all the sources of, uh, of potential problems in the past. As a matter of fact, what we tried to do is give what we call an 80-20 uh, cost view. That means that 80% of the time you'll be right and 20% be incorrect. Historically, the view is usually 50-50. And we tried to be more conservative. And one of the, uh, the benefits of that is uh, we are now experiencing this avionic stability. And you might have read about yeah, it. Let me do this. Let me, uh, sure. I have really gone over my time. Let me sure. make sure that you cover what you need to cover. But it's going a little beyond what I've asked. Sure. I will go to Mr. Tierney for a very generous 10 minutes plus. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both for testifying. Mr. Wynn, what happened uh, with the prior intent to use funding that you requested from Congress and got for production efficiencies? Uh, sir, I believe there was a chart provided to you by uh, uh, the uh, David Walker that showed that we are starting to use it when the, when the projects are coming uh, into our Attention span and well, can I just interrupt you a second? I mean, the started to use it is, is not quite the same as having told us some time back that you needed additional funds so that you could use them. We and are, and they've, to my information, from the GAO have not been implementing them to date. And in fact, the indication to me was that you sort of indicated to GAO that they had proved that in fact these efficiencies would be effective. And I thought that was sort of a bizarre approach that the Department of Defense proposed this plan. And then when the GAO came back and said, well, we haven't seen the plan implemented, haven't seen any savings from it, your comment back, the OD's comment back was, well, you haven't proven that those things would be effective. Seemed a little disingenuous. Can you explain that little byplay? Uh, sir, I think we are uh, fairly um, uh, straightforward on, uh, on our plan. There were, there were some suggestions that didn't have merit after they were investigated. Uh, it's always debatable as to what the forecasted impact would be. Uh, the returns on investment, uh, though we, we hope that they don't vary over time, some do, 
uh, and there can be honest debates and, and disagreements in that area, but we, we do need the money to, in fact, uh, conduct the cost reduction projects that we, we have identified. Well, up until we the time the sure GAO filed this report, you hadn't used the money in that regard, right? We want to make sure they're high impact. Yes, sir. May, may I have an opportunity to answer that question? That's you can. I mean, I wasn't asking you because you weren't the one that gave me those conflicting answers, but if you want to get engaged, go ahead. Well, having said it that way, <laughs> you know, now, just the, the, the issue really is when you use uh, money to improve efficiencies, you don't really see the outcome of that until you actually start building. Right. When the problem was, Dr. Samper, not to interrupt you because I've right. got a limited time, was they hadn't used the money. They promised Congress that this is what they needed the money for and said they were going to put the money into doing that and it was going to show savings down the line. On the review, they had not used the money for that and then accused GAO of not being able to prove that they would be efficient. It was their plan. We were willing to agree that it might be efficient if implemented, and that was what the money was for. Right. So that was my point. My point was they hadn't I, I used the money, the and then they made some, I think, bizarre sort of approach that it was GAO's fault for not proving that the plan DOD had proposed would, in fact, be effective. Uh, are you aware of the fact that in 03 we will be spending $207 million? In 02 we did underspend in the plan, but we're well, making that's, up... That's what I'm aware of, and that's yeah. my question, was yeah. that, that up to that point in time this we, report was done, you had not correct. spent the money. We can all agree that you have the best intentions going forward. Right. I, we, if this hearing were just about going forward, you guys would be having a much easier day. The problem is that this is a lot about a huge cost overrun in the past of this date, and I don't think that we can let it go that you're going to come in here and start fresh saying, oh, gee, yeah, let's just not even talk about that. I mean, I, Mr. Wynn, you left 16, I think you did about six pages, 16 pages of testimony or whatever, and left out everything that de dealt with the GAO. I mean, we need, in their report, we need to know what's going on here. Let me approach it this way. I got a reply from the department this week. Uh, it says the department has approved a procurement budget higher than the congressional cap. Now, Mr. Dr. Samber, you said the Defense Acquisition Board approved the Air Force plan to, Air Force to plan and program for a $43 billion production program. You also said that Secretary Aldridge approved the revised program baseline and directed the Air Force to fully fund the production program accordingly. So if you set a new baseline, gentlemen, you've approved a new procurement budget, you've planned and programmed under a higher estimate, Estimate. Tell me how you're not violating the law. If Congress set a cap at $36.8 billion. Let me first start, sir, by apologizing for the lateness of the letter. We did deliver it on April the 8th, and I realized that it was due on April the 7th, uh, and I apologize for that. It was well after the 8th, wasn't it? Okay. Thank you. We have a budgeting process inside the Pentagon, sir, that is independent of the budgeting process mm -hmm. that you consider, but does table up presidential budgets that we did in 2001, 2002, and 2003 that each showed that our intent was to go beyond the cap of, of the 36.5. When Secretary Aldrich... Uh, how, how does that happen? You have a congressional cap of 36.8 billion, and then you have this whole other system where you just say, oh, we're going to disregard that. We're going to boo our own deal at 43-something. So might I, might I say, sir, with all due respect, we, we actually have a budgeting process within the the, the Pentagon that tables up presidential budgets uh, because all may not feel the same way that you do, sir, with due respect. It's not a question of how I feel, sir. It's a question of how Congress already decided. So we So we have, they already decided. They didn't ask me how I felt. Congress as a body said it collectively felt and directed that the budget was going to be $36.8 billion. And we it's have, a little disturbing to hear now that you've got this other budget process that says that we don't agree with that. We think we're going to roll over that. We recognize that, that is a subordinate budget process, sir, to the one that you uh, and, the, and your fellow members of Congress and the Senate agree to. We do, however, have to plan a, a, a future that we think represents the best we can do for the defense of America. Well, no, I, excuse me a second. I think your obligation is to provide a plan that comports with the law and what Congress decides, not what you decide you want Congress to do but didn't do for you. I mean, explain to me where it is that you just decide that your opinion circumvents Congress's opinion and you don't like the $36.8 billion number, so that you're going to decide what's best for, for everybody and just plan at 43 and assume that at some point in time you're going to have a convincing argument that's going to win the day. Uh, uh, sir, since it is in the out years, I believe that's planned for fiscal year 06. And we did notify uh, uh, the Congress uh, shortly after the, uh, the Defense Acquisition Board as to when we thought we would schedule that. Uh, and still intend to follow through with that. 
Well, but, but you, what you don't intend to follow through with is a congressional cap, and I guess that's my point. The existing law is a cap of $36.8 billion. You show no indications at all of even remotely entertaining the idea that you might stay within that cap. Not None sure of your plans comport with it. Everything you've got is all in this higher number that I guess the Department of Defense has just decided that's what they want to do. Uh, sir, if, the, if that's the direction that the Congress, in fact, can, continues to impose, then we will comply with the law. Well, I would hope so, but it's taken us an extraordinary long period of time just to find out that assuming you complied with the law, how many uh, planes you would be able to build. I mean, that's been a, a long period of time just to get that answer, which leads me and others, I think, to believe that that intention may not be as clear and, and firm as, uh, as you indicate. I think the GAO today had some very good points about a business plan. Originally, can you just explain, I think it's worth stating for the record, what was your original business plan for the F-22 when you first put it on the drawing board? Where were you going with it? How many planes did you say you needed? What specifically did you need them for? What characteristics did you need? And how many did you need to, to uh, fit that? I'd have to take that for the record, sir. It's, it's research that I'd have to go back and do and from 1986. Right, was so the original business plan. You're not aware of what the original business plan was or where the original goal of this uh, particular platform was? Uh, sir, I haven't gone back that far to take a look. I, I encountered this program uh, um, and have uh, studied it principally to affect my responsibilities going forward. Okay, I'll yield to the uh, chairman for a second. Wouldn't, Dr. Samber, wouldn't, wouldn't that show up in your business plan that you've developed now? Because in order to know where we need to go now, wouldn't we know what we needed in the past? The, the business plan actually looks at all of those, those factors. So we should be able to find some of those answers in your business plan. Yeah, we have that. And as you can recognize, uh, since the early times, uh, the CONOPS or the concept of operations for the Air Force has changed. He has now an air expeditionary force uh, quality, and based upon this air expeditionary force new method of operating the Air Force, the number that we need is 381. Thank you. Gentlemen, tell us now what your business plan is. What do you identify as the need for the F-22? I believe the number that the Air Force has tabled up is 381, which would fill out all of the uh, air expeditionary forces and would, uh, would, uh, would allow them some overhead airplanes, which for maintenance and, and for in transit. Uh, we have introduced uh, risk into the process, uh, even at the, um, the additional funding level of $5.4 billion. Uh, we recognize that. We hope we don't get to a high, high usage, low density a construct as we are with the F-117, as uh, it has become so popular that we are wearing out pilots, airplanes, and crews. Um, but we do understand that we have introduced some risk into the process. The Air Force every year, every year stemming from the QDR down through the national security policy, has to reevaluate their best way to meet the national objectives. When do you project that the JSF will be in production? in around 2012-2011. And at the rate you're going now, how long do you think it'll be before you have 381 F-22s operational? We're not planning on 381. Our plan right now with the budget constraints that have been given to us by the DOD is 276. We have a plan on how we would utilize 276, and hopefully if we can get the additional funds and the budget relief from Congress to go beyond that, uh, the 381. Well, in your plan for 276, what do you use to fulfill the balance of any need that you originally thought might have had um, required a use of more of the, J of the F-22s? Do you use uh, uh, enhanced F-15s and F-16s? Do you use the F-117s? It's, it's a combination of all of those things. And for the record, if, if uh, some of those aspects are not classified, I'll be glad to share it with you. Okay. And what what did we meet in Iraq that we were unable to meet with any of the air platforms that we already have? Well, I think the, the greatest picture, I saw a picture on CNN where they had long uh, lines of the Marines ready to go in. Uh, without air dominance, we could not have achieved that. There was nothing in Iraq that we see right now that would have prevented us. Unfortunately, there are proliferations of these surface-to-air missiles that were mentioned this morning. 
uh, by, uh, I'm not sure if I'll pronounce his name right, but he said Dutch. Nobody else has, there's no reason you should, but <laughs> okay. Mr. Ropersberger. Thank you. Okay. Uh, he indicated, you know, the, pro <laughs> the uh, surface-to-air missiles, the so-called double-digit surface-to-air missiles, which are proliferating, they're already in China. They're relatively easy to acquire in terms of money. Uh, there is no capability other than the F-A-22s that will be able to penetrate and give us air dominance. Without air dominance, you cannot bring in uh, the forces. Uh, in addition, cruise missile defense is a very important attribute of the F-A-22s, uh, which is vitally needed. So this takes a step forward. This is, you know, as the chairman mentioned this morning, this is the unfair fight that we want. I mean, the F-A-22 gives us that air unfair fight for many, many years. What does the enhanced F-15 and F-16 not do in those it doesn't regards? Give, it doesn't give you stealth. The stealth is absolutely necessary to penetrate into these uh, surface-to-air missiles, these do double-digit. And we have no other stealth aircraft that does that? No, not, not with the super cruise, not with the maneuverability of the uh, projected F-A-22. And the important point to recognize, and I think Congressman Schrock said that, we're in the fourth quarter. I mean, we've already demonstrated all of these capabilities. I mean, the only thing that remains right now is avionic stability, and we're going to get there. So we're there. We're, we're demonstrating a plane that meets all of these key performance parameters that will enable this country to basically maintain air dominance. And that's what we need. These surface-to-air missiles, these integrated air defense systems are here right now. They're not on the drawing board. Is there something that the F-A-22 does that the JSF will not do? Yes. What's that? Well, basically the super cruise, the maneuverability, all of these things are not part and parcel of the JSF. They complement each other, but the F-A-22 is a significant enhancement. Uh, uh, Congressman, just one thing, and that's the F-117 is, in fact, the airplane we use now to, to uh, surrogate for the F-A-22 capabilities. and the Joint Strike Fighter capabilities in the future. It is, it is, if you will, that's why it's so heavily used. It is our stealthy airplane available to us. I, I thought it had some stealth capabilities. Doesn't but it, it doesn't have, Thank you. doesn't have the maintainability or the stealth characteristics of the F-A-22. You going to uh, if, if I could uh, just interrupt the gentleman, and then we need to get Mr. Schrock into this uh, dialogue. But when the F-22 began, it was basically air to air. That's correct. And we then uh, felt it had some uh, air-to-land uh, mission. Right. Right. But in the process of doing that, uh, when we load it up with certain weapon systems, it, it's not totally stealth, correct? It is totally stealth. Totally stealth? Yes. Okay. When you add these um, weapon systems, will it stay stealth then? Yes. Uh, me just what you're sure. referring to, sir, is whether it's inboard carriage or outboard carriage. I'm, I'm sure that Congressman Schrock could probably fill us all in on the aspect of this, right. but once I tuck uh, the weaponry inside the airplane, then I am inside the plan form, and so I, I can have the same stealth characteristics. When I open the doors, for example, when the B-2 opens its doors to finally drop a bomb, then uh, it becomes visible. And, and so also when an F-A-22 opens its doors to drop a uh, missile. Now, we've tried very hard to minimize uh, the, the, its emergence into the light, if you will, but I believe you, you have to, just like a submarine has to come clean where it is when it fires a torpedo. Uh, does the gentleman have another question before we go, Mr. Strzok? Uh, thank you. Uh, who, if anybody, has any uh, technology even remotely close to the F-117 well, there's several aircrafts that are being developed. Uh, France is developing ones. Uh, I think China is, de is developing that. But more importantly, if you look at our F-16s, uh, if you look at what's being developed in Korea, in uh, the UAE, our plane, if we just maintain what we have right now, would probably be the third or fourth most capable fighter plane in the world. And that's a pretty sad situation. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Schrock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is a sad situation. We used to be the leader in all of that, and we are slowly losing that edge, and that's something we clearly have to, have to change. Let me 
do a follow-up on what you were, you were commenting on, what Secretary Wynn said, Dr. Samber. Uh, uh, Samber. The F-22 is going to replace the air-to-air F-15s, while the Joint Strike Fighter is going to replace the F-16s. I did that for his benefit. He didn't hear it, I guess. So, <laughs> Let me um, uh, make a few comments on some of the things you've all said. First of all, I think this Defense Department suddenly realizes they've got to change the way they do business. And I think that was the primary goal of Secretary Rumsfeld when he took that position. But of course, after September 11, 2001, a lot of the focus changed over there. But he's trying to get back to that now. And, and a lot of what uh, the GAO folks said this morning, I was glad that, uh, uh, I think it was Dr. Sandberg that said that uh, you agreed wholeheartedly with what the GAO said. And I, I was pleased to, s to see that because clearly some things have to change over there. There's, 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 no, there's no question about that. And I'm not, Sure, I blame the Air Force, and I'm not sure I blame the manufacturers. I think it's just the mindset that's it, that's so ingrained right. over there. It's so it's a cancer in that place that at some point has to get chopped out of there, or we're all we're going to operate this way forever. And I and I know that mentality of those people who are there forever think, well, the secretaries will leave, I can outweigh them, and the guys in uniform will get transferred, and I can outweigh them. And I think that's half the problem. So we're going to have to change some of that. Uh, to make sure we don't have to have hearings like that and, and limiting the problems that we're finding here. And I, you know, I have uh, talked to the Air Force a lot about this, and I am convinced that the changes you talked about are being made. I think they realize they had some fun fundamental problems, and I see the curve going up uh, to make sure that the, uh, those, those changes are incorporated. We will, we, will, we will solve some of these problems. And I agree with the chairman, too. Um, we have to establish air dominance. I, I don't want a fair fight. I want us to be so far superior that nobody will think about coming at us. And I think we saw that the last couple of weeks in Iraq. And uh, your, your comments about the, uh, uh, the 22 being stealthy, that is so important. That's going to save a lot of lives so that nobody can home in on us. And I think that's one of the things that uh, this platform offers uh, that a lot, of don't, a lot don't. And I, you know, I, I think I hope nobody here thinks that the Air Force is the only one going to use a Joint Strike Fighter. The 1,760 airframes they're going to build are going to be used by the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps. So I think that's, that's, good bang for, that's good bang for the buck as well. I've got two questions I'm going to ask one of the Secretary and one of Dr. Dr. Samber. You know, you heard me ask the GAO about the, uh, the cost risk assessment for increasing uh, the production above the 15, uh, the 15 aircraft. And I think I read somewhere in a statement, uh, your statement from the Department of Defense, uh, that you performed an analysis. Is that true? And if so, what did you find out? What, what, were, your, what were the conclusions you came to? What we really looked at, sir, was whether the, the risk of retrofit, which is the, really the dominant thing that would affect a four airplane difference in production, mm -hmm. would be. And as I mentioned, we've, we've produced thus far seven. This was actually the, the uh, entering into a 36-month uh, purchase, uh, which gives you some also some opportunity to for inline install if you have a problem. So you look very hard at what is the risk of retrofit, which means that are you going to have these airplanes fully produced and then pull them over to the side and then install whatever the corrective action is. The risk of retrofit at the time the, was simply the uh, twin tail flutter. And when we, we took a look at that and we noted that the, the Air Force had done quite a bit of testing and simulation on substituting titanium and had gotten themselves into an acceptable risk, we've had twin tail flutter with us. I think since the F-4, uh, the F-111, uh, the uh, F-15, uh, the uh, now the and now the the F-8 and 22, so and I'm sorry, the F-18 as well. So it's not a, a, an unknown problem for us to solve. It is a question of can we get the right vibration analysis together so that we have an acceptable risk and we can then um, put the pilots. Um, uh, give them a flight policy, if you will, that they don't get to pull 10 and a half or 14 Gs uh, to, to introduce that concept. Uh, the only other risk that we, we, we saw was the integrated avionics risk. The integrated avionics risk is much like your home computer going askew. This is instable, and I mean, perhaps yours are all very stable. Mine tends to, uh, tends to go out on me when I type in the uh, strange stuff. This is really debugging, uh, and I, I will tell you that the aspects of systems engineering are important here because we have to understand how to look into the processors and, and look into the software development. Microsoft, uh, bless their hearts, uh, they have a lot of people that debug their software. 
and not just people inside the company, but all of us who are users mm -hmm. that get onto their scheme. We actually don't have that kind of capability because we don't let this out to all the universities and all of the, the public. So we must concentrate on how do you develop efficient tools to do two million lines of code and, and debug them. When I looked at that, uh, I, I felt, and as did my, uh, my, my boss, uh, Secretary Aldrich, that the risk there was actually very slight. But to put it in perspective, we did ask the, the Director of Defense Research and Engineering to conduct a review for us and give us a feeling as to whether the architecture was stable. If the architecture was not stable, then all bets are off, and now we have to go in and pull of that. And that's very expensive, and it takes a long time. Their comments back to us and their professional opinion, we would have introduced more problems uh, than we currently have uh, uh, taking that action. I'd, I would love to get this system to be modular open systems architecture. We have all but mandated modular open systems architecture for our future weapon systems. This is sort of the last of a generation. Well, Comanche will probably be the same uh, ilk. Um, that having been said, the cost of retrofit is very inexpensive uh, for any problems that arise and we see. It's the cost of duration of fix that we're now worried about. Mm -hmm. And that's what the review in June uh, is the cost of the duration of fix. As I mentioned, Secretary Samber has allocated 60 days uh, additional for this problem to be resolved so we can meet our entry uh, criteria. Uh, he's very optimistic. I must be skeptical. Your comment about open architecture is important. I'm not sure the word retrofit bothers me that much. I realize it costs money, but when you figure that they, they first started drawing this thing in 1986, here we are in 2003, you have to, people have to understand that architecture and, and technology and all the fancy things that go into these planes change all the time. As you heard Congressman Duncan say, by the time he gets a brand new computer on his desk, it's, out of, it, 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 it's old. And, I, and that, that has created a lot of this, I'm sure. So that's why I think we could, I wish we could tighten the, you get these things designed, approved, and built, and close that gap. That might eliminate some of this sort of thing. Because, I mean, as we sit here, there are probably things that are going to change in the next few weeks that we're going to want to put on the Raptor that's going to get everybody's ire up again. But the fact okay. is, we want the best that we can get. Certainly, if not in the next two weeks, sir, over the next decade. Yes. Um, yep. That's exactly right. Dr. Samber. Um, the GAO uh, you know, highlighted in their reports the uh, number of issues, especially with regard to the increased costs. And I think that's something that we're all concerned with. I know I am because we're supposed to be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. Based on that and based on what those reports said, do you really think, does the Navy, does the Navy, I was Navy, I, I guess, I, you, you can take the guy out of the Navy, you can't take the Navy out of the guy. Um, does the Air Force still think this is a bargain, this is a good thing to do, based on all the things that they've heard from uh, concerning costs that the GAO has brought up? Well, I think to answer your question, let me just go back to what I said before uh, about my comment about looking at CNN. Technology, the unfair fight, is what makes us secure as a nation. Uh, if we do not, if we do not understand the emerging threats and build planes that can basically dominate the air in spite of these emerging threats, it's a disservice to this country. We feel that this plane is absolutely needed. We think we have a handle on the cost. We think that once stability occurs in the program, once the vendors feel that this is a program that will go forward, uh, we will see something I think you said in your opening comments uh, about the C-17 or one of the other congressmen that that program, once it achieved stability, uh, the C-17 costs went down dramatically. Once you have stability and vendors feel comfortable, you'll see the cost reductions occurring. <clears throat> so once we get over this hurdle, once there is a feeling this program will, will be there, mm -hmm. uh, I think we'll have many more, I think we'll have many more planes than the 276 mm -hmm. that we're forecasting now. That happened with the C-17. The number that was forecasted almost grew by a factor of two, just based upon the stability factor. So the answer is yes, the Air yes. Force. Yes, we need it, and yes, the cost will come down. And let me reiterate again, I believe every platform, every airframe 
that has been created for the services in history has had problems with it. I mean, it takes a while to stabilize things, and we're just, we're just going through that phase in this one right now. I, I agree with you. When we finally get it into the fleet, I think it's going to serve the same capabilities as, you know, as well as the C-17 is doing right now in, in, in Iraq. But in fairness to the committee, the points are good points. You know, the yes, panel I, here was in terms of controlling cost. I agree. As, a, as the, Mr. Worker said, a lot of the things in the F-A-22 are already in concrete, and we can't do much about it. But we can learn from our past. We can right. institute some of these changes in terms of insisting upon systems engineering, insisting upon a spiral development process right. Right. that basically eats the elephant one bite at a time, right. as opposed to trying to gulp all these requirements in the so-called Big Bang. So I think we can do better. We're committed to do better. The Air Force recognizes there were problems on this program. There's no attempt to apologize for it. There's only an attempt to try to do better for the future. And I, and I agree with that. And, and, I, and if I agree with some of the frustrations that Mr. Tierney has expressed, I think we all, we all feel yes, that way. And, we and do you guys are clearly the new guys on the block now, pretty much. And you've, you've come in to try to turn this thing around. And I think I mean, it is extremely disappointing to the, the Air Force to have a program in which we can only buy, given that we get relief from the cap, yep. of 276. That is not acceptable to us. And that's why the chief and the secretary of the Air Force are intimately involved in this program, plus the CEOs of Lockheed Martin, Vance Kaufman, the CEO of Northrop Grumman, uh, Ron Sugar. They're all involved in this program. I speak on a daily basis to these people to make sure that they are putting their best people that they recognize how important it is, and most importantly, they recognize that we don't have any credibility here. As the chairman said, you know, there's been a lot of these uh, these meetings like this, and I'm sure a lot of people like myself and Secretary Wynn have come up and, and made statements to you. Our credibility has run out, so we can't come up to this panel again and say, don't worry, things are getting better. We have to perform, we have to do better. That message that you're taking to us is well received. I thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Before calling on Dutch uh, Ruppersberger, I would uh, like to just ask you, what is the cost of doing, uh, going above the cap and doing the 276? It's the $5.2 uh, billion over and above the, the cap, the, the number that uh, Mr. Ulrich uh, indicated in his, uh, his memo. That's where our costs are based on. And that includes all of the issues I talked to you before about the um, uh, multi-year procurement slippage, the JSF commonality, the inflation factors, all of those additional costs were baked in. There's even conservatism in the uh, development program. We mentioned uh, dedicated IOT&E, the testing starting in October. We actually assumed in our estimates that it would occur four or five months later than that. So there is conservatism baked into the number. I talked to you about the 80, 20 percent philosophy that we use in the costing. Uh, sir, the, I think the production number is 42.2 billion. 40, 40, what is that? 42.2 billion, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dutch Ruppersberger? <laughs> I got the second one right. Give me credit here. Let me just say uh, to the gentleman from Maryland, he's a, an outstanding member of this committee, and we really enjoyed having him. Thank you. Good. Well, first, uh, Dr. Sandberg, and uh, excuse me, I had to miss a little time. I don't want to be re repetitive. I think your comments in the end are what we all believe, and that is accountability. Uh, we all want to do the best. We want to have the best. We need air superiority. Uh, we have uh, a great military. We have great... Uh, ex expertise in, in, in our uh, business community and, and the manufacturing community that works with you in partnership to develop to develop this. But I think I think what the problem is, and I think it's a culture. You know, you lose, and you mentioned this, and the credibility doesn't mean that you're lying. It's just credibility of a of a project generally and of an institution that with, that DoD needs to be more honest uh, about cost and time estimates, and that will. <clears throat> If you can do that now, if you make a mistake, if you feel that when you get into the the, uh, the program that it needs that that you you underestimated the program that you, that uh, and that there has to be a change, then immediately that's the time when you see with the expertise and, and the contractors whoever whoever get the bids or whoever get the, get the uh, the projects that they will then come back 
because right now the credibility isn't there. Everybody wants to do well, but that doesn't mean that you're going to do well. And there has to be some accountability, and that's what our jobs are about. So let me ask you just a couple questions. Sure. First thing, um, I know uh, just about the Raptor itself. Um, where do you see it going um, from, and maybe Mr. Wynn to either one of you, where do you see the future combat capabilities based on the type of, of uh, defense we will have in the future, including the issue of terrorism, including, you know, the, uh, what we have in Iraq, we know where that is right now. We always have to be ready for that. Let me start, Marvin, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick. When, when September 11th happened, uh, no one in America relieved us of, of being uh, aggressive to the to the out year threat, uh, it actually expanded and uh, our our uh, uh, requirements for defense of America, whether it be missile defense, whether it be uh, uh, fighters, uh, we want to have our unfair fight that Marv talked about, and I'll let him take that for there. Yeah, you you mentioned. Uh, Is that because he's a doctor? <laughs> Yes, sir. I defer often. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give him a couple of aspirins after this uh, hearing. What, what we mentioned previously is uh, the fact that the air defense systems that are coming into vogue, these surface-to-air missiles, are the newer ones are called double-digit because of their increased capabilities. Right now, Iraq had a, an SA-3, I believe, the single-digit um, surface-to-air missiles that prevent the air systems from coming in. The newer systems that are under development right now, our uh, assets right now, the F-15s, the F-16s, would have a very difficult time penetrating those. The F-A-22 will be able to kick the door down, which is the expression that our chief uses, enabling us to get in there and neutralize these air defense systems in a very effective manner and being able to have air dominance allows us to do many, many things, which you see on the TV right now. Without that air dominance, our Marines, our Army people could never come in at, with uh, uh, the limited amount of casualties that we're getting right now. You mentioned terrorism. One of the things that we're concerned about is cruise missiles. The F-A-22, because of its super cruise capability, has the ability to basically protect us against cruise missile. So uh, there are many things that the F-A-22 does for us, and that's why we need it. Uh, you had missed part of the earlier uh, session, but there was a call this morning for a business plan, a business plan that would look at some of the economics balanced against the needs. We had to do that because, uh, if you recall, during the summer period, uh, the Department of Defense took another look at the F-A-22 to really assess whether or not it was needed, just as they've done with a lot of programs, because there's a recognition, as most of the people have indicated in this uh, committee, that there is other things that they'd like to do. There's opportunity cost, I think that was mentioned this morning, and whether or not the F-A-22 is a legitimate use of precious funds. Uh, the department went through a complete analysis of that and determined that it was. Let me ask you this. I missed some of the testimony. I assume you talked about retrofitting. Yes, the issue that came up this morning uh, was there was a vague comment this morning about retrofits have an exponential nature, and I think someone asked uh, them to clarify that, and there wasn't a, a real answer. What we actually did, the Air Force was asked to justify why we should produce 20 as opposed to 16. We did a cost-benefit analysis. We actually gave them what the cost of retrofitting some of these programs would be versus the cost of limiting the production from 20 to 16. That limitation caused termination cost. It caused cost associated with the eventual cost of the, the uh, production because if you ramp up slower, the cost of the, of the uh, models later become more expensive. So we gave them a detailed business cost analysis. The cost associated with retrofit versus the benefits of going forward. And Pete Aldridge, Secretary Aldridge, analyzed that with his people. And it was more beneficial on this business case analysis to go forward with producing 20 rather than limiting it to 16. And that's why the DAB gave us that ability. Are you familiar with the advanced amphibious assault vehicle? No, I'm not, but maybe... Not. Mike Are you familiar, is. Mr. Wynn? Uh, yes, sir. I have, I have a, a, enough to get into trouble. Well I, well, I think GAO report mentioned that they came, 
came in under the projections, their cost projections. Yes, sir, they did. Uh, the reason I bring it up uh, that uh, another Army base in my district, Aberdeen, is very aggressively pursuing trying to get that to be made there. So that's just a side, but it has to be parochial sometimes. Well, it did. Uh, they did a great job partnering with the Marine Corps on that right. job. Well, anyhow, um, that is a single uh, systematic approach effect, correct? Yes, sir, now, it did that. Did, what is your opinion as far as uh, systematic approach for all projects? I have been on the hustings uh, talking about systems engineering, uh, and I think a, an integrated systems engineering approach really pays off. Uh, and it will, I think, in the. You want to define that for the for the. Well, in the in the, let me just describe it in the triple AV, which is the amphibious assault vehicle, where where they did in fact integrate logistics, they integrated test, and they integrated the the systems engineering for the entire vehicle. It's very holistic design, and I think they ended up. Uh, uh, balancing weight, as you know, versus capability, and have a terrifically fine vehicle. But it is really systems engineering is addressing the entirety of the system in a, in a holistic way, so that one change here can actually be weighed against uh, the benefit to the whole system. Because different projects have take on lives, lives, lives. Of yes, the sir, they do. Uh, should we have a, a one method approach to developing our weapon systems? I, I will tell you that uh, the the world of systems engineering uh, does uh, uh, address that, but the specific aspects of each uh, technical hurdle that you overcome is different. Uh, in the world of the triple AV, they had to overcome sea states. As you know, as, since it's coming in from so far offshore, that was the big technical hurdle. Here on the on the FNA 22, it's integrated mission software and super crews that was the technical hurdles that they had to overcome. So there are differences. On the other hand, I think a systematic, disciplined approach uh, could be the overarching methodology, and, and it should be. Now, I might have, this might have been asked before, but I'll ask him if it, if it has. I don't want to be repetitive. Uh, I know DOD has said the production cost uh, for the program is $43 billion. Um, concerns have been raised about overstepping the $36 billion cap for, uh, for Congressional cap. Uh, I know DOD has budgeted 43 billion. Now, but would that be the total total cost? Uh, would, it, would it be under cost, over cost? What is your feeling? Right now, we we estimate that we can get between uh, 276 and 290. The Air Force is trying to get way over 300. They they have uh, uh, great plans for the cost reduction projects that are underway. Uh, and I think uh, the Secretary Samber is right. Once this program stabilizes, I think we are going to see remarkable progress. Right now, uh, all of the subcontractors are a little bit nervous as to whether or not they're going to get to produce or not get to produce, and so they're they're hedging their bets, if you will. Well, if you have some inconsistency, uh, they might scare every, everyone away. We don't want to do that either. Yes, Let me ask you the final question. Um, the, the, assuming that you get the program under control, cost effectiveness, you know where you're going to be, your estimates are correct. And again, the cost estimates uh, uh, are just so important for credibility at yes, this sir. point, uh, with the flexibility that you might need depending on what occurs occurs in the future. If in fact it, 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 it where, where would you like to see the program go? What would you like to see based on based understanding where, that we're in a very difficult economy right now, we're having the historical deficits. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of issues in, within our economy. It's affecting education. It's affecting other issues on the home front. Based on that consideration, and if you get your program under control, where do you think we should go? How many How many of these uh, airplanes do you, do you think that we should really really build for the future? Right now, from our perspective, sir, we have introduced at the at that um, the the budget cap of 40, 43.4, I think you mentioned. Uh, we've instituted for right now a buy to budget. But it does, it, it, which means that we would like to see 276 to 290 uh, approximately. We realize that this introduces some risk on the part of the Air Force, but it has a, a lot why, to do. Why, why, why risk on the part well, of the Air Force? Well, because they want a 381, uh, which fills out their 10 uh, uh, air, air expeditionary forces. Now, it really does depend, though, on whether JSF, Joint Strike Fighter, stays to its schedule. All those acronyms, remember, I just Yes, started. sir, I know. This is a Joint Strike Fighter is the fighter that's coming along, and it is doing very well, by the way, and we hope to make it. Uh, I, I recognize that there is a, the, the, this was called uh, the, um, a, a model, uh, but we really do have, have to 
hope to uh, make the Joint Strike Fighter a model. We have a lot of international people relying on, uh, on our capability to produce this airplane, not just the Marine Corps and the Navy, but our, all of our armed forces. If it tends to slip, and programs are very fragile in this regard, then we may extend uh, the F-A-22 production. If it stays to its schedule, I think there's going to be a real debate. Okay, thank you. I have a question to ask at the end, but Mr. Tierney has a question, and I think Mr. Trock's all set, and then we'll get to our next panel. Thank you. I just, you know, we talked about why there's a credibility issue, and the gentleman didn't want to talk about the past, but, you know, recently Air Force Secretary James Roach had this comment to make. If you use the CAG, the Cost Analysis Improvement Group divisions, you get 276 planes. I don't care what the hell ours is. It's 310, who cares? I think it's that kind of dismissiveness that gets everybody up here concerned and why uh, you find us making some inquiry on that. But with that said, you know, today we talked about the congressional cap as it exists now, $36.8 billion. And the testimony that you gave me was that you think somewhere between 225 and 235 aircraft for that amount. The interesting thing about that is uh, Mr. Aldrich told me back in 2001 that he could get just 224 airplanes then. Uh, if you could have gotten 225, 224 airplanes then, and now you think you get somewhere between 1 and 11 more, the 225 to 235, I don't understand how you get an increase, you stay at the cap of what it was in 2001. Costs haven't decre decreased in the past two years. Labor hasn't become cheaper. Schedules haven't been accelerated. All the avionics problems haven't been resolved. In fact, on all those things, just the opposite seems to be occurring. So it would seem to me that that means fewer than 224 planes, fewer than Mr. Aldrich told us in 2001. Sir, an estimate's an estimate. I defer, of course, to my, my superior knowledge of my boss, uh, but an estimate is an estimate. 224 is certainly within the range that I expressed. Well, you know, let me tell you that since the 2001 estimate, is $763 million has been taken away from production and put towards development. Right. 876. 876. Right. All right. Thank you. Right. Um, so I guess that would further reduce the number of planes. That, that's already baked into the numbers that, that you're seeing now. Not the, two num not the 224 number, though. Not, not. Well, it would be because the 224 is based upon the reduction in the... No, the 224 that Mr. Aldrich gave me in 2001 preceded you're taking the 800 oh, something dollars correct. and putting that's it correct. over. So yes, that's correct. from that number, 2001, yeah, it right. would actually you're reduce right. it on that. So right. You're right. I mean, we just keep going around and around, but if that's the case, you're down below 224, and, uh, and that's at the congressional cap. And so I, I just make that note on that, that this doesn't seem to be consistent. If you had to stay within the cap, the congressional cap, and you had uh, 224 or somewhat fewer or somewhat more uh, planes, how would you compensate for that? What would the rest of our force look like going forward? You ask a question that is best answered by the people in the XO, our operations. They would have to assess what could be done with 225 or two, or more than that. Uh, you know, I'm not the right person to ask, so... So you didn't, you didn't draw the plan, the game plan, somebody else, the business plan, somebody else did that? The plan, there's two aspects of the plan. There's a business plan associated with cost, and then there's a requirements plan, the operations plan. And that's and, not... And that's done by the, by the warfighters. Okay. Because I think it would be worth knowing whether or not, if, you, if the cap were maintained, whether it's worth proceeding, you know, whether or not the, you know, the 224 or less is something that does, uh, serves a purpose. I think that's what Mr. Walker was getting at. What's your mission here? What, what do you want to do? And if not, what do you replace it with? And if it is worth going forward with, then if there's a right. difference between that 224 and 276 or 381, what do you fill it up with? And, and how is that going to serve us? And does it serve us less expensively? And we're able to do other things militarily, our homeland security or wherever else, with the difference that we better off in the long run having uh, put our monies in that regard. And I think uh, we would like an opportunity to see the, those, those two plans, the two aspects of that plan. Uh, and I don't know how, quite how we're going to work that out if some parts of it are classified, but I'd, I'd like you to get back to me and the committee on that, if you would, as to how we might uh, get a hearing or at least have provided to us that plan and the, and the two aspects of it, the operational aspect and the business aspect of it. Is that something we can do? I'm not sure uh, with respect. The Air Force has never looked at the 224 number. The Air Force has looked at uh, uh, the 381, the 339, and the 276 number for a business plan. Uh, 
And that's regardless of the fact that Congress set a cap at, at the other number. Well, well, you have to understand two aspects, and I'm not apologizing because, you know, I, I understand the point that you're making here. Uh, I was not here when the uh, DAB, led by Secretary Aldridge, told the Air Force to plan for an increased budget. We're not anticipating exceeding that budget until 2006, uh, so we haven't exceeded the budget. Uh, we've been planning based upon our guidance from the uh, acquisitions are, and, and that's how we've been planning. Well, if you would exceed the, the cap by $5.2 billion, just getting to 276, uh, are you able to tell us now how much you would exceed that cap if you went to 381? I don't have the number, no. Now, okay. we would, you know, obviously what we're hoping for, you know, your previous question talked about why do you see, imp what improvements would happen. Now, one of the things that we used in our estimate right now is a certain learning curve. And, and I think you're familiar with a learning curve, which tells you as you build more, how does your experience help you? Uh, Lockheed Martin, when they made the estimate, we asked them to be very conservative because we wanted to maintain credibility. We didn't want to go back to the well again. Uh, Lockheed has been arguing with us, basically arguing is the wrong choice of words, but trying to give us evidence that as this program pro uh, progresses, that learning curve should improve significantly. In addition, the, pro uh, the producibility costs that we've been uh, spending on this program, that investment, we assumed in our relationship that we would get a 5.6 return on our investment. Some of the earlier projects have been achieving 18 to 1 or better. Uh, we took the more conservative view. Some, uh, a lot of people in the, in the group have forecasted significantly higher returns on their investment. But we've come back and given a lower number again because we want to maintain credibility and not go to the well again, so to speak, in terms of our estimates. So we're challenging everybody to do better, and we're putting in processes in place to do better. But you've, you know, you've asked very fair questions. Thank you. Uh, earlier, you said that there are two of our allies, the you, European Union and uh, South Korea, have airplanes or, or technology that, that may make us even third in terms of uh, capabilities for fighters. Actually, there is a program called Block 60, which is being produced uh, in the UAE with the F-16 plane. That is the UAE, the United, UAE Arab United Arab Emirates. Arab Emirates okay. That will be significantly available. another ally of ours. Generally, I mean, we sell them well, military we, equipment day in and day out. I hope the hell they're they're, they're considered we hope an so ally too, or, or right? a friend, right? We hope so too. So that uh, the tech and they're doing that partially with the technology and some aspects of that that come from us. They're doing it with all of our technology. Right. We gave them the ability so to... So we have the UAE, the European Union, and South Korea all building new fighters that now make us believe that we have to have a capability that exceeds that so that well, we don't end the up question, further the question down the, is, the line the, here. The, the question, if I may turn it around a little bit, is not the issue of a fighter capability. The question is the air defense systems. When you come in and you basically try to establish air dominance, there's two things that you're worried about. First, you're worried about their integrated air defense systems, their radar and their surface-to-air missiles that basically recognize you and then send out missiles to kill you. And then you're also worried about the fighters that they have that can basically take you on right. as you, as right. you defeat them. And addressing them. that part of it, I mean, I think what you're saying is that those three countries, at least, using our technology, may have got the Better air defense. But I'm also telling you that in the integrated air defense systems, the surface-to-air missiles, the double digits, will be proliferating to other countries that can be, for example, if and, Iraq... And how will they be proliferating to other countries? Because they're being sold by China. China makes it. Russia is making it. They will sell these things uh, and to, to other countries, at, and countries will buy that. And is any of that technology ours at all? No. Okay. Uh, Congressman, I would say that, the, not, not to debate the cataloging, but the... The, the real concerns are the Russian Sukhoi 31, if you want to get to airframes, and that's also being uh, exported to, to uh, China. The Russia cannot produce in quantity, I agree, but they are selling their advanced engineering products uh, to India, Pakistan, China, and others. And they still expect, need a market. Thank you. Who do we expect that the, the United States is going to export its technology on the F-22 to? There is no plans to export the F-22. That is, is that that we're putting a prohibition on it, or are we just saying there's currently no plans? There is no plan right now. What about the JSF? 
a joint strike fighter. I think there are currently eight international partners, uh, starting with the UK, Australia. Um, I'm not sure I can go down the list, but it, it, it ends with uh, Italy. So it, this it, following some of our logic, does that mean that uh, just by virtue of the fact the minute we get the JSF done and we start selling it all around the block, that now we've got to come up with something else because of that proliferation and where that might go from there? I think we really do uh, look at the Sukhoi 31 rather than look at uh, confronting any of our allies. We do carefully an analyze who we uh, intend to partner with. Uh, and when they get this airplane. Uh, but we do hope that our technology progress continues. We are a, an advanced engineering uh, country, and we, we will, I think, continue to push the envelope, lest there be somebody out there. Well, I, I guess my point is, and I think you've got it, is that uh, it might be one thing to be concerned of other people's technology. It's another thing to be giving right. them ours and not to be concerned that they have it. Right. Thank you. Uh, one last thing, if, if I could. The producibility improvement projects, the so-called PIPs, I, I really just want to get a clear stand of where we are there. They, they were identified, Dr. Samber, by you as investments to improve manufacturing processes or to incorporate new technologies to reduce costs. Yes. At one point, uh, there was an indication that those were going to be used to save us costs. Uh, but another point, as I mentioned earlier, the, the GAO was accused of failing to provide credible evidence that these investments in PIPs would reduce costs. Could I ask both of you to tell me now, do we believe that the investments in PIPs do reduce costs or not, and will they be used on this project or not? The answer is yes. We are. You agree, we, Mr. Wynn? We I certainly have seen great evidence of that, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before letting you go, uh, Mr. Wynn, uh, we'll get you out with the 10 minutes you wanted, and I hopefully can get you out of the Thank 15 you, minutes that I wanted. Um, Mr. Tierney uh, had raised some questions, and I, I want to just uh, nail this down a little better on two areas. First, uh, that the argument is we don't want it to be a fair fight. And I do want to respond and say that part of the argument, as I heard it, was uh, with the F-16 in particular, that our allies uh, are, are the European market, uh, European Union, uh, South Korea, and others are going to be developing uh, the same technology and, and surpassing us. But um, with the Joint Strike Fighter, we clearly are going to be taking a, 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 a much improved plane. And our allies, some of whom you've met, you know, the European Union will have a, a, a good look at that plane as well. Uh, obviously, we're building it with the Brits. Uh, what we've asked GAO to do is uh, do a tech trans uh, for, mm -hmm. uh, transferability study on the implications of that, because it, it does concern us, because we don't have that unfair fight in a sense if that technology is out there. Uh, and that becomes almost an absurdity. We'll keep making the argument our allies have it and others have it because we shared it with them. But <laughs> I think the, if, yes, if I may just uh, interject for a second, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, what we're saying is that these air defense systems, again, these double-digit surface-to-air missiles, so-called double-digit SAMs, are there now. They're basically proliferating. They're being made in China. They're proliferating throughout the uh, third world countries. For a limited investment, these people can basically stymie a, a great deal of our capabilities in terms of air dominance. And the FA-22 is here right now, as Congressman Schrock so eloquently put it. We're in the fourth quarter right now. The FA-22 is a, something real that will come out. No, the we're, JSF we're, we're is we're not going to be point, here. We're beyond the point of arguing whether we're going to have the plane. But we're, we're, the issue is understanding the logic, uh, though, of what we're doing in, with the JFS in particular. And so, and just wondering this race when you get the point. Yeah, we understand. OK, yeah. but let me just ask you this other, because I, I really have trouble with these numbers. If, if, and, and you, have, you both have been, uh, I think, very candid with us. Um, I would have liked to have seen the business plan before the hearing, but you have been very candid with us, and I appreciate that. And, and it is a good way to have a relationship, and we are all on the right. same team. That is for sure. That is for sure. Uh, but um, what, I, what I'm wrestling with now is that in an attempt to help me, Mr. Wynn, you said to stay within the cap, we could build 200 and 25 to 235 uh, planes. If I take the higher number, the 235, that means to do the 276, which is your intention, 
uh, that's 41 additional planes. When I subtract out the 36.8 billion from the 42.2 billion, in other words, the additional 5.4 billion, you're saying that we can do 41 planes for 5.2 billion, and if we use the higher number, excuse me, the lower number of 225, you're saying we can do 51 planes. And I have a big disconnect, and I think you can understand well, why. Sir, I, I haven't said we could do those kind of, uh, the, when, you, when you do uh, large variances on small numbers or small variances on large numbers, estimating is fun to debate. But what I said was at the 43.4, at the I thought they could get between 276 and 290 uh, if things go well. Down at the lower end number, I, my estimate was 225 to 235. Okay, I make no insinuation as yeah, to whether to, that... I'm going to take the lower end either. I'm going to take the most conservative. But, sir, it, an estimate is an estimate. I have no, I have no quarrel no, but, if you but, take a different estimate. No, Mr. Chairman. No, 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 no. Hold on a second. Yes, sir. I appreciate estimates, and I understand where they are, but I'm taking, you gave me a range, and I am taking the lower of, 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 of both. In other words, I'm, I'm taking, saying you're going to have 235 um, at the cost of the cap, and I'm saying not the 290 number, I'm taking the 276, and that is 41 planes. And you're, you're basically saying that you, for 5.4 billion in that marginal cost, are going to do 41 planes, and that strikes me as going to be difficult. If, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, may I just try to attempt to answer that? We've been talking about learning curves, and what learning curves tell you basically is that the first units cost significantly more than the latter units. The last tranche of planes are significantly less expensive than the first tranche. I agree with that. And that's why you can get basically for that 5.4 billion, you can get significantly more planes. I, I'm just wanting to put it on the record that at, at, that you, we're saying we can get at, at the minimum 41 planes with those estimates. And we could potentially, you're saying 51 or even if I go to the 290 figure, uh, my gosh, we could get, you know, in the, in the 260s. So, I, I mean, excuse me, we get in the 60s. It's just, it's leaving me a little uncertain here because it seems to me quite a drop in marginal cost. But if you're comfortable with it. Yeah, we are comfortable. I'm not comfortable, sir, with any estimate. I, I am only trying to answer the question no, no. On a, as best I could. No, I, you're trying to answer the question as best you could, but with all due respect, you, you're a professional here, and we've gotten to the point where we can start, because we are in the fourth quarter, make some meaningful estimates. We're, we're and, comfortable. And I, didn't, and I didn't pin you down mm -hmm. to, you know, from 225 to 227. You, we gave you a range of 10. I'm just using the lower number. Okay. From the Air Force's and point of view, and we're not playing tricks here. We're just yeah, I, I, I think I your, your that, understanding sir. of the issue is very clear. From the Air Force's point of view, our point here is that there is a lot of leverage to be gained at the ends of the of the programs when you add money there because the marginal cost at the end is much lower than at the beginning, and there's a lot more clout. So you can get more planes. We feel comfortable that for that extra investment, we can get that additional number of planes. And that, you know, I'll tell you, as a member of Congress, I'm going to be asking you to get more planes at those marginal cost differences. And, and that's and that is legitimate. That's why, as you add if more quantities, you get more value. The unit costs go down, and the la the latter part of that run is always significantly less expensive than the beginning part. Okay. Here's what we'd like from you, gentlemen. We'd like. Uh, the cost of the program, we like the cost per plane, and we want to know how many planes you need. And so that will be something we'd like from you in the interim. And in regards to the business plan, I, I, I didn't want to make a big deal out of it, but we are members of Congress, and we do have access to, obviously, uh, classified information. And this committee has never, ever had, uh, in the time that I've certainly chaired, any problem with classified material, ever. And we have been told many things that would have been interesting for people to know about. So uh, whatever you send us, uh, if you send it to us in a classified way, it will be secure. But we want to know the cost of the program, the total cost of the program, the well, cost per plane, and how many planes you need. Well, we can give you those answers right now. The cost of the program, it will live within, within the caps. 
I mean, if, if we cannot get relief from the congressional cap, that'll be the cost of the program. Yeah. If, the cost, if the cap is relieved, the cost will be the $42 billion number. Uh, we're estimating that with the relief of the cap, there will be 276 planes. And there are a number of, uh, of uh, you know, various. Congressman, in the interest of time, could I please take that for the record and get with your yep. staff and yeah, get no, you an it, answer? It, you have been patient. You told us up front. You both have been very fine witnesses. Um, and uh, we, we, I appreciate, Dr. Sandberg, you putting that on the record, and we'll, we'll nail it down a little better. Thank you, sir. And you have 10 minutes to get to your next meeting. I hope you have a chance to stop along the way. Thank you very much, sir, and thank you very much for holding this, conference, this thank, meeting. Thank, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, we appreciate you being here. And appreciate your service to our country, both of you. Our third panel is Mr. Eric Miller, Senior Defense Investigator, Project on Government Oversight. Mr. Christopher Hellman, Senior Analyst, Center for Defense Information. Mr. Stephen Ellis, Vice President of Programs, Taxpayers for Common Sense. Gentlemen, if you would come up, stay standing, we'll swear you in. If you'd stay standing, uh, Mr. Miller, we're going to swear you in. Raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Note for the record, our three witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Um, I think I would uh, do it as I called you, and I think you are in that order, Miller, Hellman, and Ellis. We'll go in that order if it's, uh, well, that's the order we'll go in. <laughs> Thank you both. All three of you, rather. Mr. Miller. Uh, your mic is not on. I, it needs to be, a, I think it shows a light on when you, does it show a light when it's on? It's on now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to comment on controlling costs and tactical aircraft programs. Founded in 1981, the Project on Government Oversight is a nonpartisan, nonprofit watchdog that strives to promote a government that is accountable to the citizenry. I was uh, very impressed with the candid testimony of Mr. Walker today. Just because I want to make sure that it's clear for the record that we are asking the business plan from the Department of Defense and, and uh, the Air Force, and we'll just make sure that that is part of the record. I think it's clear, but I want to make sure. Thank you, Mr. Miller. I'm going to have you start all over again. We're going to start that clock okay. over again. I apologize. Surely. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to comment on controlling costs and tactical aviation. Um, founded in 1981, the Project on Government Oversight is a nonpartisan, nonprofit watchdog that strives to promote a government that is accountable to the citizenry. I was very impressed with the candid testimony of Mr. Walker this, this morning, and we would tend to agree with many of his conclusions. We would, however, have to respectfully disagree with Mr. Walker on his testimony that the F-A-22 will be the best aircraft ever built. From our vantage point, the facts show we don't really yet know how the tactical fighter will perform, particularly in the area of avionics. After all, it has not been operationally tested yet. Um, your instincts to closely scrutinize the financial aspects of the FA-22 program are right on target. Uh, as you have seen, probably observed, the Air Force has a public face. Uh, but the people that we talk with inside the acquisition system share your concern. In places where these people let their hair down and feel free to talk candidly, they question whether the FA-22 has a role, if it's worth the cost, and if it really will work. Just like all of you, we continue to read troubling public accounts detailing out of control cost escalation in the FA-22 program and reports of seemingly insurmountable technological challenges. We also understand from our contacts and sources that critical pr problems within the program have been the subject of some rather heated internal debate at the Pentagon. We wish the debate would become more public. My organization typically focuses on holding weapon systems accountable 
and we rarely call for the outright cancellation of a major weapons system. However, in light of the 9-11 tragedy, we are now more than ever convinced that an F-A-22 buy is not consistent with the Pentagon's goal of transforming the military. In fact, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld has publicly stated that although he has, has to pick his battles on canceling systems, killing the F-A-22 is a battle he's considering taking on. The F-A-22 essentially has become an aircraft without a practical mission, not unlike the B-2 bomber, that have for the most part been sitting on runways even during recent conflicts. Why purchase one $257 million aircraft like the F-A-22 when you can buy several F-16 Falcons or F-15 Eagles for roughly the same price? It doesn't make sense to us. The F-A-22 is a, is a solution to a problem that no longer exists. Of course, anyone who studies the history of the Pentagon's acquisition system would be hard-pressed to claim that rising costs, the dumbing down of testing, and the shrinking number of buys are unique to the F-A-22. It looks to us that what you as members of com Congress are now facing is a repeat of the procurement of the B-2 bomber. At first, the Air Force told us that 40 billion would buy from 135 to 150 B-2s. In the end, you might recall, you only got 21 B-2s for that same price, each costing roughly $2 billion. To us, the only reasonable answer is to terminate the program. It doesn't take a clairvoyant to see that the F-A-22 is shaping up to be a part of the problem rather than a solution to the Air Force's shrinking tactical fighter fleet. It may be a sleek looking aircraft and fly a little bit faster and longer than other US fighters, and it may be somewhat harder to detect on a radar screen in darkness, but it's a budget buster, its structural soundness is suspect, and its avionics package is still little more than a dream. The Air Force wants this aircraft so bad that it's willing to mortgage the future. We fear that unless you as members of Congress will have the, have the will to hold the military and defense contractors accountable, the F-A-22 will become another sorry chapter in the history of Pentagon acquisition boondoggles. Thank you for inviting me to testify before the subcommittee. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, Mr. Hellman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee, and uh, also to Mr. Tierney um, for bringing attention to this issue and, all, and also for uh, his able representation of my home state. Um, like many analysts, I believe that cost growth in successive generations of weapon systems is, is inevitable. Um, over time, the threat will increase. Capabilities of, of systems uh, that supersede the past generation have to be improved correspondingly, and new technologies are usually more costly than those of the current technologies. Um, it's also a truism that costs of developing a new weapon system uh, will rise over original estimates. As uh, uh, one of the previous panelists pointed out, um, historically that expectation is roughly in the range of 30 percent, and that's due to a lot of factors. But if one agrees that with the precept that cost growth in weapon systems is, is to a certain extent inevitable, then I think an important question is uh, what extent of cost growth is acceptable and how does one determine what is reasonable and what is unacceptable? And further, uh, in attempting to answer that question, um, it's critical to discuss whether strategies that might limit this growth ha are applicable and if so, whether they've been adopted. Um, with that in mind, I, I, I reference uh, statements earlier by Mr. Tierney where he was discussing uh, the PIP programs um, that GAO identified and, and the services um, use of some of those funds not to uh, leverage uh, additional savings in the future, but actually to pay for, for existing cost overruns. Um, the second thing that I think it's important to point out is the impact that, uh, that, that cost increase have in programs like this. Um, as, as, as GAO has pointed out, um, this is going to have an impact on efforts to modernize the, the tactical air force the tactical aircraft fleet. Uh, the first impact is going to be uh, there's going to be a slower rep replacement schedule of existing aircraft. What that will do is drive up the costs of operations and maintenance of the existing aircraft as they age 
these costs always are inevitably go up. And if you replace them more slowly, uh, estimates about uh, the growth in O&M costs are, are skewed. Um, the second thing to point out is uh, that the number of aircraft ultimately uh, will diminish. And I think that this has been discussed uh, at length here. Uh, we talked about the original 648 uh, down to, at this point, um, a possible number as low as 224. Um, this also has an impact, um, particularly on the overall age and, 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 um, and cost of maintaining the TAC Air fleet. Um, earlier, the gentleman from GAO alluded to a study that they had done, actually, that, that, that GAO had done back in, in 2001 that looked at the average age of the TAC Air fleet and the effect that the current modernization program would have on that age. And what they, what they discovered and what, and what some of your questions have highlighted is the fact that the current plan, and at that point they were talking about a buy of 339 F-22s, not the 225 uh, that, were current, that were being discussed under the current cost cap, uh, was that the actual age of the Air Force fleet would, would, would grow um, over the current and, and well above the, the, the target age of about 11 years um, of age for aircraft in that inventory. So in effect, what happens is that if you stick with the F-22 program uh, and look at it as a solution to your modernization of the, of the TAC Air fleet, not only is it not the solution, it actually it, it increases the problem. Um, and then I want to return to something that, that uh, Mr. Walker spoke to this morning, um, which I haven't heard quite so well defined before, but the, the plug and hope approach to determining number of aircraft that will be purchased in the F-22 program. Um, I think that uh, when you look at that, that number, uh, the 225 or the 276 or wherever it is, um, you have to recognize that that number really doesn't do you a lot in terms of one-for-one one replacement of the existing fleet. And this is something that, that I, I believe you, you, Mr. Shays, brought up earlier, which is what are these aircraft attempting to replace? Uh, even at the 381 mark, which is the most optimistic number I heard discussed today in terms of aircraft that would be acquired, you're talking about a one-for-two replacement over the current fleet of, of F-15s. Um, while technologically the aircraft could be twice as twice as good as the program it's designed to replace, at some point numbers do make a difference in terms not just of um, our, our ability to, pro to project force on a given battlefield, but just the aircraft that are available to do the things that they do when they're not fighting, training, um, um, maintenance, those types of things. You, can't, you can only substitute technology to a certain point. And my concern is, is that when you get numbers this low, uh, you're not going to be able to fill out the roles of all the things that you're asking our Air Expeditionary Forces to do in the future. And the question that was raised but not answered, and I did hear some very good answers today, but one of the questions that was raised and not answered is if you look at the lower numbers, the two, 224s or the 276s, what other types of aircraft are you going to be looking at uh, in order to uh, fill out the numbers uh, across the TAC Air Fleet so that you can do all the things that the Air Force is going to be required to do in the future. Um, and I'd be interested at some point in hearing that, that, that information revealed to us. And with that, um, I'd like to say once again thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hellman. Mr. Ellis. Good afternoon, Chairman Shays, Congressman Tierney, Congressman Schrock. Thank you for calling this hearing and inviting me to testify. It's been very informative and helpful. Um, it has uh, caused me to, as evidenced by my, my testimony, which I've scribbled all over to try to uh, revise it and uh, improve it so that I could be, uh, provide some assistance. Um, I'm Steve Ellis, Vice President of Programs at Taxpayers for Common Sense, a national nonpartisan budget watchdog group. In the six years my organization has been watching the FA-22 Raptor program, we have found it to be a veritable poster child for some of the problems of putting the weapons production cart in front of the development and testing horse. The unprecedented cost increases of this program, coupled with several other factors, including a reduction in the number of F-A-22s procured, the development of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, and the overwhelming air superiority the United States already enjoys, raise a fundamental question. Do we need to continue to pursue the acquisition of the F-A-22, or is it unnecessary and redundant? We cannot stop asking questions just at improving the acquisition process. TCS strongly agrees with the Comptroller General that the, uh, that the Bush administration, the Department of Defense, and Congress need to seriously evaluate 
what are our actual needs, and whether the FA-22 is still an essential part of our force mix or if the billions planned for this program are better spent elsewhere. The disciplined acquisition procedures embodied by fly before, you, fly before You Buy basically conduct operational testing and evaluation before moving into full scale production have been ab abandoned in the case of the FA-22. Until that approach is rectified, cost overruns, system failures, and a lack of performance can be assured. The simple mantra of the carpenter, measure twice, cut once, also applies to aircraft acquisition. But the Air Force's aggressive production plan for the F-822 seems to be cut first and measure later. In an admirable but failing effort to control cost overruns, although we hope not in the end failing, Congress mandated that the F-822 production costs not exceed $36.8 billion. However, current DOD estimates put costs at $42.2 billion, $5.4 billion over the cap. Additionally, the Air Force buy to budget strategy reduces contractor incentives to control costs and essentially guarantees that taxpayers will get fewer aircraft for the money. Or worse, contractors and the Air Force hope to use an old salesman trick to force taxpayers to buy more to meet the real need, purportedly 381, after the production run is over. This is the plug and hope approach Comptroller General Walker discussed. Rather than slowing down Rather than slowing down or potentially pausing proposed F-822 production levels to stabilize cost overruns, DOD has done the opposite, increasing 2003 production levels to 20, arguing unconvincingly that the increased costs of terminating some contracts, inflation, and reduced manufacturing efficiencies outweigh the high risk of expensive retrofitting and repair of aircraft and more costly delays. The problems revealed so far in the F-822 testing impair safety and performance. The Air Force posture seems to be little more than a policy of get as many planes as you can, as fast as you can, despite the long-term risks. This is more of the buy before you fly approach that got us in the vicious cycle of cost overruns and project delays in the first place. The delays in aircraft delivery have forced DOD to slip schedules, but instead of shifting the full testing and production schedule, DOD plans to slip just the testing while leaving the timing of the full-scale production decision unchanged. The new schedule removes a three-month lag between the two and requires the production decision to be four months before the completion of OT&E. Common sense, as well as recent experience with the F-A-22 and other weapon systems, has revealed that significant changes and improvements generally result from OT&E. But under this plan, 25 to 30 percent of the production aircraft will be completed and will have to be re retrofitted at possibly significant cost. An additional risk fact, additional cost risk factor, is that by um, is that only 14 billion of the 27.3 billion of the announced program cost reduction plans are implemented. One cost reduction tool, the Product Improvement Production Improvement Plans (PIPs) require an initial government investment to improve production processes, but are predicted to reduce long-term cost growth by $3.7 billion. However, in FY 2001-2002, the Air Force had used $87 million in planning PIP funding to offset cost growth in the first two production lots, as previously discussed. By failing to invest in these improved processes, we are guaranteeing that some of the planned savings in future years will not occur. The Air Force has led taxpayers down the primrose path on the cost of the F-A-22. Original plans called for 750 aircraft at $68 million per plane. We just heard that DOD uh, could purchase 225 to 235 planes for the congressionally mandated production cap. That's more than $250 million per F-A-22, roughly six times the cost of an F-15. The acquisition, and, the acquisition and procurement problems serve to highlight that this program needs further scrutiny. Uh, the, fu the fundamental question of whether we need to pursue acquisition of the FA-22 remains and taxpayers need it to be answered. Thank you again for inviting me to testify. I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Ellis and Mr. Hellman again and Mr. Miller. We'll start with Mr. Schrock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Mr. Chair, let me say before I question, first of all, welcome to all of you. I don't usually say this about hearings that I attend all day, but this has probably been one of the best ones I've been to since I've been in Congress. This has really been good. And I'm telling you, I have learned a lot of things from people I didn't think I was going to agree with that I do agree with. And I think when that situation happens, I think a lot of good things happen. And I appreciate everything I've heard and what Thank you, you, you all say, too. Let me just make a couple comments. Mr. Miller, no one, I think you're right, no one's questioning that there have been some real problems with this platform, and uh, they, need, they, they certainly need to be correct, and I think they are, and it has cost a lot of money to do that. So you're dead, you're dead right on that. You mentioned that the, the, you felt the F-16 could probably do what the F-22 does, but the, with the exception, I believe, that the F-22 has the stealth capability that I think is going to be so important for our warfighter in, in future years because our adversaries out there are creating all sorts of nasty things they want to lob at us, and if we can get, an air, if we can get a pilot in and out real quick and do the job, I think that's going to save lives, and I think that's got. To, I really think that has to be one of our one of our main goals. And uh, I, I don't think I heard you correctly. I, you're, you weren't suggesting the B1 didn't isn't doing what it's supposed to do. It did a beautiful job. I think it's done a beautiful job in the last three weeks. I hope I didn't hear you. No, sir. I was talking about the B2. The B2. The B2. Oh, the B2. Okay. A more sophisticated, stealthy bomb. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Let me. Uh, I have one uh, question and a comment mm -hmm. after for Mr. Miller and then one for Mr. Ellis. Somebody gave me an article when they knew I was coming here to read from Fighting with Failure series. I think you're familiar with that. And the stated purpose of the series, of course, was to document weapons that don't, uh, that don't work, that waste taxpayers' money and aren't suitable for combat. And, 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 combat, and they uh, particularly focused on the C-17, which clearly had its problems initially. But I'm wondering if you all still believe that the C-17 doesn't work uh, and it's not suitable for combat because I think it's done a yeoman's job. And in, in, um, no, we, we don't believe it doesn't work. It, it it's had some problems and it has some it very. If you read the most recent GAO report, it has some astounding maintenance cost problems. Mm -hmm. uh, very cost uh, costly aircraft to operate and maintain. Um, it has not qualified in some areas. For example, dr dropping a brigade of troops and such. Some of its aspects have not been realized fully yet. I think we were more critical of the, the actual process of the development process. Just the development process. Let me, let, let me make a comment on that, and it's, it's a statement, and it's, it, it follows on from what I said this morning uh, about the C-17, and I, and I raise it because I think it's, it's relevant to this discussion. You know, this, the C-17 went through the same turbulence that the F-22 is, is going through now, and many, question, many people questioned its value, and in fact, we reduced the numbers for what was planned, I think, to be 220 down to about 40, to as low as 40. And we were wringing our hands about the development issues, and now we're back up to 180 with potentially even more being built. And it really has proven uh, almost everything I think we've anticipated. And I can't imagine not having that platform, not having that airframe in this particular war that we're, we've just gone through and, and continue to go through. But uh, guess what? All that hand-wringing and, and doubt uh, caused the caused the plane to cost more because we were producing fewer, and I think the F the F-22 is going through the same thing. It's it's no different. So we need to really get and I think that's what you're all saying. We need to get stability into these programs so we can so we can get the cost down. And at some point in the Pentagon, they have simply got to do that. And as I said before, I don't really blame the Air Force or the manufacturers. It's all within that mindset at the five-sided puzzle palace across the. Uh, across the river, where I worked for several years, so I understand uh, the problems they have over there. But I think there's no doubt in my mind that this is going to be a, we, we need this aircraft, and it's it's going to be a good one. And Mr. Uh, Ellis, you're from the Taxpayers for Common Sense. That's a great title. I love it because uh, I think we all, as taxpayers, we all need to have common sense. But I I, I have an opportunity on a, uh, almost a weekly basis to talk with the men and women in uniform. I represent the Hampton Roads area, which is Virginia Beach, Norfolk, and represent more military than 385 members combined. And one of the things, we, when you ask them what they're most concerned about, you, you swear it's going to be pay and benefits, but what they want is equipment that works. They want spare parts, and they've been sorely lacking in that for a long time, and that's one of the key things I hear from them. And, of course, the cost of maintaining a lot of this equipment, a lot of the airframes, is, is skyrocketing. And, and I find myself you know, increasingly concerned that if we don't modernize, we're going to find ourselves no longer uh, able to provide the warfighter with the air dominance that we've all talked about 
uh, here today, and especially as we've seen demonstrated in the last few weeks in Iraq. Uh, how does your organization propose to deal with these issues? And as a taxpayer myself, modernizing and modernizing with the incredible capabilities of a platform like the F-22 just seems to make common sense. How would you do it differently? Well, uh, first let me uh, say that um, your, I have, your, credib I've, your credibility is always pre already pre-established being a coastie. Yes, because yes. Part of the sea service is that really R right? Not only I not like only a, a, a coastie, but I'm son of a of a career naval officer naval oh. and nephew of another one. So oh. the, had a lot of time in the Hampton Roads area. Just gone as up well. two more rungs on the. Yeah, I, I know, I know. <laughs> well, I dropped one when I went to the Coast Guard Academy no, no, instead no. of Annapolis, no, but. Not uh, at all. Not but the, 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 um, and actually the other thing on reliability and understanding that is, is that um, the, uh, the ship, the first ship I was on in the Coast Guard was uh, the Coast Guard Cutter Sorrel, which I happened to be on board for the... You uh, can watch this hearing online at cspan.org. We're leaving this now to take you live to Doha, Qatar for today's Central Command military briefing. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 2.